people uh, behave like civilized civilized people out of society, and he's going to open up all the cell doors and just let everybody just do what they do. No guards, no locks. And I kind of wanted to talk about that because that's an interesting it's an interesting topic. It's an interesting concept, but I think that it's uh, I think probably someone's going to die <laughs> doing that, you know. So you know what? Hey, but I wanted to. I wanted to. It's yeah. funny. It's funny Hold you on. mentioned that. You. It's funny you mentioned it because I did. Um, I did. Uh, uh, I, I did see it. I. I saw it. Uh, as a matter of fact, last week, uh, uh, me and my lady were, were watching it, and uh, I guess they're trying to like that, that new California model, I guess. But uh, but in, I think it was county jail. It wasn't. It wasn't state prison. A lot of these dudes, they hadn't been sentenced yeah, was, yet. Uh, I think ultimately it was. It was a success. Um, you want me to call back on the video, James? Yeah, 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 yep, yep. All right, I'll call yeah. back right now. All right, cool. All right, so they're gonna be calling us, calling us back right now, and uh, I could, I could, I could, I could hear you though. Oh, that there, there it is. You. That, hey, that's why. So yeah, so yeah, so um, uh, uh, um, he uh, so the, the yeah, the sheriff was trying something new, and um, my phone's going crazy. Over here. Hold on, give me one moment. I'm not sure what the hell's going on. Okay, uh, so so. Snap. Hold on. So the sheriff, yeah, the sheriff wanted to try something new, and uh, so so he uh, he uh, he opened up the doors and whatnot, and and. Uh, llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. He, he wanted to see yep. if if they could if they could interact with each other, you know, without uh, you know, with, with uh, without it being chaos, and and ultimately from what it looks like, I mean, for whatever the way they portray the portrayed it on um. On, on, on the Netflix series, everything was uh, everything was good, and and uh, and uh, I guess they were gonna roll it out to the rest to the rest of the prison. Yeah, and so I just think like, look, it, that that got me thinking, and I understand the concept. I understand the concept. I see what it is. Look, if we we can't learn to behave in here, we sure as hell ain't gonna behave out there. Um, that's. I mean, they're doing it with the integration. That's how they're doing it with uh, integrating S and Y and GP. They're saying if we can, if we can remove the labels from ourselves in here, then because those don't apply out there, then we should be able to do it out there. You know, so it, what he's doing, he's got the right idea, but there has to be some, there has to be some control, some law and order. There has to be. Yeah, there has to be some law and order, but we're we're not here for being disciplined, rule following, law abiding citizens. So just to, to they, throw them out in the pool like that without a life raft, without I don't think that's very responsible on their part. I think you have to spoon feed uh, liberty and 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 freedom to people who have never respected it, and and that's that's what I believe they're doing here in California now by trying to create this new model. They're trying to give us incentives. They're trying to give us privileges they're trying to like spoon feed it to us because the reality of it is you know if, if they just dumped all this stuff on us you know I, I think we would take it for granted the same way we took our life and our freedom for granted we wouldn't know how to utilize it responsibly we wouldn't know how to appreciate it and and so i i think by just dumping them dumping them in a, in a building like that i think me personally i think that's more about ratings and and and, and show than and actually effectiveness shock value yeah, shock value you know it, it's like that 90 days in stuff like that like i i don't think that i don't think their 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 true their motive is true i don't think it's genuine you know with respects to to creating a, a, a an establishment of humility there humanity i think it's more for show you know but I, what they're doing here in california is a little different what they're doing here in california is they're they're actually you know that right now matter of fact they're doing you got you got uh, may 4th coming up is which is may the 4th be with you i guess it's a star wars day or whatever and the captain right here on our yard actually has these dudes uh, drawing on all the buildings right here, like a bunch of big ass Star Wars mur murals, which is sick. You know what I mean? Like that's crazy to see that in prison. You know, it's tight. You know, like, okay. and it just gives, it brings, it brings a little bit of hospitality to these yards that you don't normally don't see. You know, it's like Groundhog Day when we walk out here every day. You see the same thing. You see the same routines, the same patterns. So when you actually get to walk out and you see these big old colorful murals on the building, it kind of just, it, you know, it just kind of helps reconnect you with humanity. It kind of takes you out of the day-to-day -day rat race that, that's prison, you know? And so, yeah, uh, it's a trip. No, the, the, no, it is. And the, the crazy part, though, the crazy part about this whole deal, right, this whole deal right here is that, look, 
we're here, Jesse and I, we're, we're incarcerated right now for murder. <laughs> we, we, we're here for killing people. Imagine if they were to do that. And that's just us. That's just, you got, we're two out of two on this, <laughs> on this podcast right here. Imagine all the dudes that are in this building right now for murder. For some, we, got de- we got death row here. We got people that are actually condemned because they're shutting down San Quentin. We got those guys here, too. You know, they're, they're moving them all across California, and this is one of the yards where we have those guys. Some of the listeners have listened to Carlos' story, and he's right here in this building. The fact of the matter is, is you can't put that policy in place widespread <laughs> you know, because people are going to die. We're, we're in recovery, Jesse and I. We're in recovery. We're not, we're not hurting people no more and stuff like that, but that's just us. You know, I'm looking around this day room right now, and I see, yeah, a lot of, this is a, this is a, a easy-going yard, but you never know who's here. You never know what people got going on. You got to be more, uh, they got to be more mindful of who's in those buildings. They're probably low-level drug offenders. There's probably no hardcore gang members in there. Yeah, it's, uh, so it's on, something, man. It's something that I've been thinking about. So, hey, you're definitely, you're definitely right, yeah, because, I mean, if I was there, I wouldn't want Richard Ramirez, you know, sleeping next to me or selling up with Richard Ramirez. Hell no, nah, I can't be sleeping next to the Night Stalker, even though he's dead, but, <laughs> right, but yeah, right. you're, you're, I would have beat that dude up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would have beat that dude the, the Night Stalker would be sleeping by the door in my cell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Nah, but, hey, so... So real quick, I wanted to talk about you know I know we've I know we've had the privilege of of generating some 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 pretty cool you know listeners and followers and subscribers on on the channel and and uh and I and I was made privy to the fact that that we've had an attorney recently you know reach in and ring in you know somebody that's that's in the field of 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 expertise that that we're all seeking here you know everybody that's actually a participant in this channel are all at some point in time you know have to go to board or have been to board you know and and and, um, and, and i just thought that was awesome you know i haven't had the the privilege of, of speaking with her you know and, but i definitely want to send a shout out to her because uh we definitely appreciate her her listening we appreciate her advice we appreciate her commitment to what she does, you know, and, and, and preparing her clients for, for that day of judgment. You know, it's not even judgment so much. It's that day of redemption because the reality of it is you've already been judged. We've already been judged. And when we're going there, we're, we're presenting ourselves to who we are today and in and, and, and hopes that, that they're able to understand and see who we are today. And they afford us that, that privilege and that opportunity of regaining our freedom because we took it for granted and, and, and we basically gave it up. So I just want to thank her for that. And, and um, I'm looking forward to hopefully getting a session together where, you know, she can actually come on live and, and, and we can, you know, we can set up a, a time and, and, and each of us can go on there and, and ask her questions, you know, and, and, and help refine, you know, some of some of our perspectives on some of these things, you know, like like uh, give us what it is that, that they're actually you know, looking for today because sometimes in here it's the deaf leading the blind and we only know what we know. We have all the programs they give us and we know how to utilize them. We know how to apply them. You know, we internalize them so it becomes us. But sometimes it seems like the, the goalpost is, is, is forever moving in the BPH process, you know. And so we just want to make sure that we're doing the right things necessary to prepare ourselves for that day for the day of reckoning you know and and, and uh, i've been there myself already as we've discussed you know before and and for me personally i didn't have a bad experience yes i got a denial i that's they gave me what i had coming you know and, and actually truth be told if i'm honest i had a, a bigger denial coming i had i i could have easily gotten a five-year denial and and they would have been well within the rights to give it to me but they respected the journey that i was on they respected what i had been doing with my life over the last few years and they gave me a three-year denial but uh, uh, and, and like I said, it was for me, it was just as simple as a conversation. They're having a conversation. They're not asking me questions if I've done the work that I don't have the answers to because nobody knows me or my story like I do, you know, but it's always good to hear what, what are the particulars are, are you know, are, are what they're looking for and what it is that, that they, they dislike and things like that, because it's, it's good to know, like, you know, the same way they get to re review our full C file and everything about us. 
prior to going into those hearings, they, you know, they, they have a perspective of us already. So it, it, I think it's fair game for us to be able to know who we're dealing with and what it is that they expect specifically of us when we go into that hearing, you know? So uh, uh, I just, again, I encourage her to call in any time and, and be a part of this channel, you know, because that brings, that's bringing another component to this channel that, that, that we're setting out to do you know like this this is a redemption this is a restoration channel you know i mean it's not it's not your normal prison you know glorification prison podcast channel this this channel is about showing people another perspective to prison another perspective to the individuals inside this place to show that hey they're not just letting out a bunch of murders out of prison like these are who these guys are yes they committed a very vicious heinous crime that can never be excused but listen to who they are today so that way there's some comfort in the in the people who have to live in the communities with us you know so i encourage her to to uh come on live with us sometime and and and, and you know maybe we could structure a show around you know some board prep on here you know to let people see what it is that we have to go through and the things that we have to know about ourselves in order to obtain our freedom one day you know and you know what no, I'm, I'm cool i I'm glad you mentioned. I, I'm yeah, glad I you mentioned. I'm glad you mentioned Lisa. I actually just uh, sent her a text message asking her if she could, if possibly, if she's available, she could call in, and uh, she responded that that sure, you know, she could call in. I'm not sure uh, on how long she's gonna be calling in, but yeah, Lisa, the lines are open. Uh, you could go ahead and call in, and uh, everything's ready for you to for you to for you to jump on with uh, with uh, uh, Jesse and uh, Jesse and David. Yeah, that's cool. That's awesome. Just just having that time for us means a lot. You know, I mean, that just lets us know that she believes in the cause. You know, she believes in the cause. You know. Yep. Are there actually people listening in right now, James? Can you see the feed? Is there people on there? So right now, on actually on YouTube, yeah, we have uh, three people. We got uh, we got Righteous Monkey, and, and he writes uh, he writes shout out uh, Dave, David and uh, Jesse. And then uh, uh, Lisa was actually on, so she heard what you said, so she actually wrote thank you uh, on the chat. And then uh, that, uh, yeah, cool. and, and also, you know, uh, you're welcome. And then we actually do. We do have some people on uh, on uh, what is it on TikTok over here? Uh, sorry, I've been neg neglecting the the comments on TikTok. But uh, uh, let me see. What do we have? Uh, we have. Uh, oh, we're getting, we're getting the call. Número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. Hello, Lisa. Can can you hear us? Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. Yep. Sure. Sure. Can hear you. What's up? How you doing? What's up, Lisa? Awesome. Good morning. Good morning. My How name you is doing Jesse Nava. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> Good morning, Jesse. Nice to meet you, too. You sound yes, like you're yes. doing a lot of the right thing. Le queda un restante de 60 oh, segundos. Absolutely, absolutely. I've only, I've only been on the right path for about four years now, but this has been the best four years of my life. You know, after you know being incarcerated 23 years, the previous 19 years I was just basically running amok. You know, just doing, living the same hopeless lifestyle that brought me to prison. You know, T totally normal. I think did he just yeah. get cut off? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah. That's hey, okay. Hello. And, and you know what? And I want to mention something to you, Jesse, right now. So we got L.A. Dodger. I know you had mentioned him last time on, on our last trip last Sunday, and he says, I'm here. Uh, uh, he's also he's also an ex-lifer. Right. Okay, yeah. Shout out to L.A. Dodger. I remember he gave us some pretty good feedback last time, and, and we appreciate that, man. It's always cool, you know. It's always good to hear from the people out there that have made it and are doing it because it, it, it helps create that synergy of hope up in here, you know, because it gives us, a, a, a you know, just another point be like hey man look at look at what they're doing out there you know there's it, this isn't this isn't a, get, obtaining our freedom and, and and success out there in society was never an attainable thing so so living hopeless in here was easy you know and now it's like constantly you have people out there doing the right thing you have people out there getting out of places like this after 25 30 years and going out there and living their best life so it's just a reminder because that there's definitely a fear factor involved when you think about obtaining our freedom again you know i can't help but to think like man i don't know that world the world i know is totally different from the from the civilized world you know and and, and so there's definitely a little bit of fear, a little bit of fear factor of calling now being recorded. I think about going out there after 25 years, but it's okay because I'm not going to be encapsulated in the prison in Santiago de Centinela, Centinela, California. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. You have a prepaid call. You will not be checked. 
Gracias por utilizar Global Town Link. All right, so hey, I'm, I'm getting good at this. I'm finally, you know, I got everything integrated uh, uh, nice now, uh, uh, and uh, uh, everything's starting to run a lot smoother. So I'm definitely going to give myself, I want to pat myself on the back for that. Man, you deserve a pat on the back. You definitely, you, you definitely got that coming, James. It's getting better and better, man. We're proud of you, bro. None of this would be possible if it wasn't for you, dog. <laughs> yeah, man. Hey, thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. And, uh, uh, do you guys want to do you guys want to switch it up so we could we could have uh we could have us uh, uh, the ghetto the ghetto uh, t Tony Stark on on on, on, the, on the phone with us yeah, or on, yep. on the video yep. and then uh... yeah we're gonna bring I'm gonna bring Dave over here Dave's gonna call you back right now on the video so you guys got the uh uh, uh would you call him the car Clint Clark Kent oh yeah Clark Kent yeah Clark yeah Clark Kent the ghetto Clark Kent <laughs> Yep. All right. Hey, Lisa, I appreciate you calling in. I definitely have a question or two for you. Once I'm going to jump on the phone and, and then uh, we can continue this conversation. We're going to put Dave on here so that way uh, he can get some video time. I appreciate you and everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Yep. All right. Yeah, we're going to swap right now. Right. You want to just go back on that one, Dave? On yours? You want to All right, Lisa. So, um, uh, you know, so I, 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 you know, I appreciate, you know, you sending out, um, you know, the, those documents to me, the AB 600 information. And uh, uh, what I did was uh, I printed them out. I printed out all the information and, and I, I sent it over to one of my buddies that that's currently right there in Centinela. So hopefully, you know, he's able to, uh, 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 you know, get, get himself back to court and, you know, possibly, you know, uh, get himself uh, home, uh, home earlier, you know, sooner than later. What? Good. I'm glad to hear that. So, the AB, I want to let you guys know, though, though, the AB 600 has a funny little clause in it where it says the judge doesn't, because they removed the middleman, the CDCR, the DA, and the public defender from requesting an inmate get it, a resentencing through AB 600, because the inmate can do it now, they have a funny clause in there that says the judge does not have to respond. They can just leave it in the air. So the AB 600 is kind of tricky. It helps to have some other vehicle to get in front of the judge for resentencing, like an RJA petition, a habeas petition. But I just wanted to let them know that don't be shocked if you don't get an answer because the, the public defender's office are inundated with all of this resentencing. And so they're trying to figure out how to manage everybody coming to them, which that's not our problem. That's theirs because the laws have changed and all you guys have rights to do this. So we're we're finding pushback up in Northern California, but we're we're trying to figure out, you know, how to get this. Um, but just FYI, so just... I tuned in to the to the tail end of that. How are you guys doing, Lisa? How are you doing? Um, good to know you. Uh, I'm doing good. This is I'm, my name is David Lopez. Um, I'm Jesse Sally, and um. It's crazy that you said that you mentioned about the resentencing and stuff and because I'm currently in that process right now um, I'm sentenced to 40 years to life right now um, And I say right now because things could things could change um, I was sentenced right. in 2015 to 42 years to life and um, I currently went back under uh, 483 which was the two one-year prior prison okay. So right. my whole case is re my whole case is reopened right now and um good they just oh, made a, yeah excellent. they just they made an rja claim right now uh, good Justice Act, oh. that claim and yeah they're they're going uh and then also i qualified for um because i got 25 to life on a gun enhancement so good. i qualified for 620 good. so i can have a hearing on the gun enhancement so there's a lot of things that are going on and oh, i'm just glad yes. that it happened yeah i'm glad that it happened when i was in a position to you know i have something to bring to the table i'm over six years clean myself and um, Good. I'm just, I just let everything go. Yeah, I'm over six years clean. Because here's the um, thing, like too. And a half years clean. Yeah, and I'm just, I'm done. When, just you not... guys, when, you guys, when you guys bring these petitions before the court, whether it's a herd or whether it's an AB 600 or whatever petition you're asking for or whatever resentencing you're doing, your institutional behavior and your programming does make a difference. They will look at that. So that all plays into whether you're going to get resentenced and, and have time served and released. They want to see the rehab. They want to see you guys do clean time. They want to see these things. And that plays into their decision. So if you're going to file an AB 600 or a herd or something, and you're still got mass RVRs, or, and you're still yeah. doing criminal thinking, it's not going to play well for you. You know, even though, 
it, it, you know, all, all things are taken into consideration when it comes to that kind of stuff. Yeah, and you know, and I, yeah, I understand all that, you know, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And look, it, I started my change when I started my change. I still had a, a parole date at 2056, I think, at that time. And then I had another one that went down because of different laws, like Prop 57 made me yeah. eligible for um, 66%. So my time started dropping down, but I started my change because I was tired of living the way that I was in prison. I was just, even yeah. out in society, I just didn't want to hurt nobody no more. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be on meth no more. I didn't want to be in a gang no more. I was just, I had just reached yeah. that point in my life, that rock bottom where I was just done, you know, and it was, it was hard for me to, to evaluate what my future was from that point on, you know, I'm completely clean and sober um, during, during those years, right? Right when I started, um, it was hard when the smoke cleared to look and be like, man, I still have to serve three plus decades in prison. You know, what am I going to do now? <laughs> you know, there's no, there's nothing to hide from. There's nothing to hide behind now. I can't hide behind the gang. I can't behind, I can't hide behind the drugs. Yeah. I can't hide behind the violence. There's nothing but looking inward at who I was up until that point and looking outward onto what I had done to the world. I had a lot of guilt. You know, I'm here for murder. I, I, I was convicted of second degree murder. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. They're never going to have that. They're never going to have that second chance. And that was hard yeah. for me to do with. They hit me like a, like a floodgate open, you know, and I yeah. just, uh, it's very, it's a very difficult thing to, to think about. And not it's only my time journey. seems, you know, my time doesn't seem that, that severe anymore, you know, if looking at it from that perspective. But yeah, it's what it is. Yeah, you're what doing really well. And then that's what usually I, I come across is that you guys are usually done with the gang mentality and being used and then yep. being disciplined. For, you, you know, you go and you do all this stuff, this gnarly stuff for the gang and then God forbid you don't do one thing, then they turn around and DP the heck out of you guys, and then you're sitting there in Aztec or wherever thinking, why, am, why, why? I just gave my life to these people, and they're, they're kicking my ass, and this isn't, this isn't life. Like, we call them, unfortunately, on this side of the um, fence, we call gang members domestic terrorists in the community, and for us at board, we really, I always tell my clients, that you have to own your shit from way back when, because if you can't own your shit from way back when, then I can't sit there in the closing or during the thing and saying, look at how great he is now. Like I, I some yeah. of you guys want to diminish or minimize the gang activity, but that's the la the board does not care about. Okay. You know, I have to be careful. I think the things I say, the board isn't looking at you at 20 years ago. Of course they were looking at your criminal behavior, your, how did you do on probation? And, and when you were out and all that stuff, but that was then. They want to know that you can yeah. say, yes, I did this. Yes, I dropped a guy. Yes, I did this. Um, and when you minimize a sentence, like sometimes I'll read something like, oh, and um, he, she just fell or she got pushed. I'm like, okay, that's not what happened here. We, we need to own this shit. Say what you did, own it, live in it, and then move past it. That's Yeah. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. No, you're absolutely right. And um, that's that's why I've had to, I've had to ask myself, okay, well, the situation that happened was considered a, a gun for drugs deal gone bad. You know, um, I went to sell a gun to somebody, and the person I was selling the gun to, I shot him and killed him. Um, it went bad, and that's what it is. Um, yeah. I take responsibility for that. And there was a time when I was minimizing where I was saying, okay, well, I only went there mm -hmm. to sell the gun to the guy. I didn't go mm -hmm. there to shoot the guy. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that's not, look, why But he had then did I have, I had another gun on me? Why did I have another gun on me? The gun that I sold the guy, well, that I was attempting to sell the guy was not loaded. I went there to show that I was willing to commit murder. I, w I went there showing that that's who I was. That's the type of person that I was. So regardless yeah. if he wasn't the intended victim, somebody was going to be yep. because that's the yep. type of person that I was. I understand that. Yeah. It took me a lot of years yeah. to understand that. Look, I'm carrying a gun because yeah. I'm portraying the image that I'm willing to shoot somebody. 
That's who I yep. was. Yeah, and, and that, that question comes up a lot. Too, I didn't understand that. Yeah, and that question would come up in the board too. And and the way you came around the corner and and unminimized it, that's what they want to hear. That yeah. you did have the intention to do harm if it was presented to you in that moment. For sure. And it would if it wasn't him, it would have been somebody else. I was taken off the streets yep. because I shouldn't have been out there. I should not have been out there yep. in society the way that I was behaving, the way that I was thinking, the the gang ideologies that I was subscribing to, I yep. shouldn't have been out in society. And this is a consequence. You know, you see behind me this is a cell yep. block. You know, I got a shady cat walking back and forth behind me, but good thing that that's Jesse. <laughs> but, you know, but yeah, I'm. This is where this is where I'm at. You know, and this and is what happens what when you subscribe to that ideology. And you know, it's it, that's awesome that you've come to that point. Sometimes I hear this is my new favorite line that I get from one of my inmates. He told me, you know what? I've had a couple innocent guys come to me, and that's really hard and sad too. But but the big picture when you guys are in prison is like. One guy said to me, look, man, I'm not in here for the, my commitment offense. I'm here for all the shit I did before that. So before you guys ever get caught for your commitment offense, your lifetime, there's a whole lot of shit you all did before that. So you're, you're, you're doing your time for a bunch of reasons, not just your commitment offense. Because you're right. If you wouldn't have gone down for that, it would have been another time. And half the, most of the guys just say, look, if I wasn't in here, I'd be dead. So... You know, the road you're going down really has two ends, you know, death or prison when it comes to gangs and stuff like that. Yeah, no, it, you're, you, you said it, you said it perfectly. There's only, there's only one way it can end up, you know, whether, I mean, well, there's two ways, death or incarcerated. And it's not, the being in prison for life, it's, it's not, it's not a fun, it's not a fun feeling. It, it, it hurts. It, it's hard to be away from my family. It's hard to be away from my loved ones, but most importantly, it's hard for me to, to think about what I did to that individual's family. You know, I listen and to And I'm them so glad to went. hear you say that because a lot of yeah. the time, um, the victim remorse, we call it victim remorse, and sometimes, yeah. and we do ask for victim remorse letters. If you guys can't understand, and another thing the board says, if you, if you can't understand the harm that you caused, then they will think that you can do it, they will do it again. So the fact that you have yeah. remorse is huge yeah. and if you and i'm hoping that you would write a victim remorse letter sharing the fact and remember some guys have hollow i call them hollow victim remorse letters a lot of times the guys say look it's my fault i take responsibility for it i own it okay it's my fault i take responsibility on it okay but that's kind of hollow because you're not saying what what you did a lot of the times i'm, I'm telling the guys hey, hey man remember when that mom and dad have to have Christmas dinner or when they have to have Thanksgiving dinner or what about their child that they're never going to get grandchildren from or what about their medical bills or what about this? Think about that and write about that, how you took that, that future from that family away. And if you can write like that and show them the remorse that yeah. you caused and the harm, yeah. then they're going to go, oh, this guy gets it. Okay. It's all about whether you get it or not, whether if you get the harms that you cause. And, and so sometimes we have two types of letters. One's called a direct victim's letter, and the second yeah. one is an indirect victim's letter. And that's the harm that you cause the community, the police department, the ambulance. the um, Even your family, by the way, would be considered more like indirect victims. Sometimes guys put in their victim remorse letter, and I'm so sorry, my, my mom is suffering and my sister, and yes, Absolutely, they are. But those can go into like an indirect victim. Le queda un restante de 60 segundos. Yeah. No, it's, it's, you know what uh, I mean? it, it's very difficult to, to think about, you know, and it's, yeah. I, I do think about, he has a, um, I believe his son would be 16 years old now, because I know he was around two, I believe. I, I listened to them when they did their victim impact statement, and he had a young, he had wow. a young, young child, two years old, and wow. I, I just keep thinking about him, you know, like thinking, man, it's yeah. 16 years old, I was in the system already, me and Jesse, we were, um, we were in the juvenile system, and um, we were there together, you know, and I was thinking about the type of kids wow. that we were in that system, you know, we were, we were really rowdy kids, we were always fighting and causing problems, you know, but we were around a lot of kids that, um, their dads, their dads died the same way that you know I had I had 
shot my victim, you know, and I, and I think about it like, man, yeah. you know, this is where they yeah. ended up without that guidance. And I always just, the back of my head, I always wonder, man, I, I hope, you know, that he's not, he's not in juvenile hall himself. He's not going down the same path that I was going yeah. down, you know, and it's just, it's a horrible thing to think about, you know, and that's my fault. Yeah. I did that, and I have to take responsibility for that. You know, I, I absolutely do. Every time that I say no to, to using drugs, anytime I, I use uh, coping skills instead of fighting, that's all in out of respect for the person that Good. I killed, for the people that I harmed. Um, and it's not easy in here sometimes, but I know that what I'm doing is right. And you know what? I love that you mentioned coping skills on the inside. Um, a lot of the times what I say when I'm doing my thing is, um, or at the closing at the end, if I have a, usually we need somebody that's no less than three years clean yeah. from any RBRs. Five um, years Lisa, is a this is going to cut off right now. I'm sorry. The video visit is going to call yeah. off. Do you want us to call back, James? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Give me a second. I'm sure Jesse's back on. He's calling in right now. Yeah. Up right now. Okay. Okay. Let me call back. Are you back on, Jeff? He's about to be. This call is now being recorded. Okay, Jesse Nava. 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 Un individuo encarcelado en de la prisión estatal de Centinella, Centinella, California. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. You have a prepaid call. Gracias por utilizar Global Telling. Hello, Jesse. All right, so yeah, we're uh, we're back on right now. I'm just waiting for uh, I'm waiting for David to call back in a uh, video. I think I think I should have enough for for one more, and um, and then oh, after yeah, that, yeah, he we'll, was only gonna. He, then we'll go on the phone. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that'll work. That'll work. Hey, so I I wanted to ask a quick question, real quick, before I I, I understand that the I wanted to ask Lisa this question about I understand that the BPH is 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 really pressing the line about restitution, right? And uh, yes. and and putting money on books. So I, what I wanted to do is I paid my restitution. I, I paid my restitution, and uh, when I committed to my recovery, I, I made sure I paid my restitution because I knew that they would they would be frowned upon. And because I've had a long history of dealing drugs in prison, and I didn't want them to be like, okay, well you sold all these drugs and you couldn't give a dollar to your, your you know to the victims. So when I committed to my recovery, I made sure I paid every 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 cent you know of what I owed, and um. And even then, that doesn't say anything because that's money that, that, that like, I, you can't put a price on life. And I took a man's life, so it, it's just horrible to think that, that, that they could put a price on it. But um, I wanted to ask you, so I don't know restitution, right? Are they sweating? If I and, I'm, and I don't shop for anybody. I don't go to store for anybody because I go to store myself every month. But if I have other people putting money on my book, is that a problem? Um, it depends on who those people are and if there's any history with those people because they can trace, um, as long as you're not, well, you know, you know, when you guys do that, there's that 80, 20 split, right? So they, as long as you're not doing it with some, as long as somebody else that's trying to evade restitution is not part of the people that is putting money on your books. Because if one of those people is evading, then they're going to trace him. And they're going to see who else he puts money okay. on. As long as you're not doing any kind of weird split, you know, hey, yeah, I'll take the 20%, you get 80%. And that's part of, that's restitution evasion. But if it's clean and... Yeah, like, what like, like basically, like basic, basically, my Sally and I, we make taffy and we sell taffy. So instead of... Instead of people paying us strictly out of their out of their canteen, I, I can get a JPay on my books, or or like yeah. the, the guys that I get taffy money from, they go to store themselves. They just don't like cutting into their food either. You know, like they don't know restitution. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to be like, oh, you're avoiding, you're helping people avoid responsibility. It was like, no, no, no. I, you know, the people that put it, it, it and it's small, like it'll be like forty dollars or something like that. But I just didn't want to leave anything open. For, for because I like I said I paid my restitution. I don't shop for anybody. I shop. I go to store every month myself. I don't you know like I don't need the I don't need the extra couple dollars from somebody else to go shopping for them. And know? that's good because 
that's good then. If there's nothing behind it, then you'll be fine. They they can investigate this stuff, and I have heard them stopping hearings in the middle of the hearing to go back because they didn't get the answer they want. They knew there was something fishy going on, and so they've stopped the whole hearing. So they can check it out, and if it's clean, if you're just doing it for taffy and what have you, then there shouldn't be a problem. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. That's cool then. That's good to know. I know they could probably make an issue later, like, hey, well, you're not supposed to be uh, uh, capitalizing while you're in prison. But I think I don't think they're going to be digging around like that. If, you, if I, the work, given the work that I've been doing and the work that we've been doing, like, I don't think they're they're looking for reasons to deny us anymore. And that's the one thing I try to get people to understand. Like, if we get denied, it's usually because something. Uh, uh, it's it's because we gave them a reason to, not because they were digging around getting thirsty right. for a reason because they're not really out to get right. us. They want us out of prison. That's the truth of life. Right. If they don't you know yet you might have some conservative commissioners that don't necessarily feel as much about restoring as the other. True. But they're still True. not trying to keep us here, you know Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. Hey, I'm back on the I'm back on the line right here. Uh, I don't know what happened to the video call. So okay. I actually, I actually only had forty cents. So what I'm doing right now, I'm, I'm adding more money, so we could, so we could at least do do one more. Uh, so just give me like maybe like two, three All minutes right. while, while I, I load up the account right now. All right, okay. We're already, uh, we're over here at the table. Yeah, we're at the table right now. Hey, you know what I was tripping on the whole thing? She knew about the, she knew about the the eighty twenty split. Eighty twenty. That blew my mind right now. <laughs> You've been running right. a over there, Lisa. Uh, who you going to store, who you going to store for? What the heck? She knows about the 80-20 split. She knows exactly what it is. You guys got all kinds uh, of racks in there. Yeah. Right? And, it's, and it's funny because I, 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 I literally didn't pay my restitution until 2020, 2021. I didn't pay my restitution yeah. because I utilized that 80-20 split. I was like, forget that. I, what do I look like? I was playing the victim. I was from living in a victim stance, and I was like, why would I pay restitution? You know, it, it, I'm here because of them. And, you know, like just you, you have this warped perspective of what's really going on. And, and when, I, when I came to the realization, like, hold on, man, like, look how hard you work to try to avoid responsibility and paying your mm-hmm. restitution, this and that. Mm-hmm. I said, no, the first thing I did was pay my restitution. Yeah, and that, that's yeah, the thing because I there's pay, a lot I that goes into good, good because there's a lot that goes into restitution yeah. evasion when it comes to criminal thinking. You got to get a buddy, you got to have an yep. agreement. So that's already guess what? Two or more engaging in criminal activity, which they're going to say is gang activity, quote unquote. Even though you and I would consider three or more for the benefit of a gang, but the board is really loose on that definition of a gang, which is a whole other ball game that I'm trying to deal with. But if you're resti- if you're evading restitution. They're going to say you're still criminal thinking. You know, it's just like a cell phone. It's like, you know how many steps you guys have to go through to get a cell phone in there? And even if you say, well, I'm just talking to my family. Yeah, but still, you had to get some guy to do X, Y, and Z, and then this. And then you, the, the contraband that I've seen you guys to have to, sell, to hide your cell phones is really impressive. I mean, you guys are very creative when you start to make things to hide your contraband. So it, there's a lot that goes into the criminal thinking when you're trying to hide or, you know, do things like that. No, you're, you're right about that. You know, I was now you just got to reapply that energy somewhere else. Well, that's what I, that's what I do. I, I just turned everything that I was doing criminal-wise, I turned it right side up. Yeah. The driving okay. motivation that I used to do for that, I do for positive, you know. And I overachieve sometimes, and I have to be careful because I don't want to be labeled as a crime chaser or anything like that, you know. Like I do these, mm, I do a professional these programs programmer because, sometimes. Yeah, professional. Yeah. Sometimes it's yeah, a professional I do these program. programs. I became a I became a Gogi certified community coach. Uh, I'm a facilitator Good. for ARC programs, CGA. Yeah, I just you know I'm working on three college too. degrees. Where Good, really good. Yeah. And here's the yeah. thing, like yeah, we well, won't call you both a, of us, Jesse won't and I. Call you because some people do, and I have heard the board say, oh, you're just chasing certificates. But here's the thing. It, your institutional behavior will reflect whether you're just a certificate chaser or a professional programmer or not. Because if you are doing all these programming, then you should not be engaging in criminal activity of any kind. They're saying if you're programming and you're still doing gang stuff inside, then you're not internalizing what you've learned. 
So that's so if you've internalized yeah. what you're learning, all of the stuff, all the programs. And here's the thing: when you take that many, I love to write one in my closing. I'm like, man, my client had so many, so many programs that I literally ran out of space on my paper when I was taking notes. Like. That's like a good yeah. thing. It's not a bad thing. But as long as your institutional behavior reflects what you're learning, then they can coincide and live in harmony, if you will. You know what I mean? The the two, the behavior yeah. and your um, programming. Right. Yeah, we think about that. You know. Um, yeah, Jesse and I were both in. We're enrolled in two colleges right now. Um, Jesse will be finished probably maybe a semester before me. Yeah, we're we're both in, we're both Imperial Valley College students, and we're both in Coastline, and we're in line for San Diego State University because they have a they have the uh, bachelor's program here. So as IBC Good. students, Imperial Valley College students, yeah, we have um, we're we're already lined up for San Diego State University, and we're gonna be getting three degrees at least. Like me, I'm gonna get this uh, uh associate. Yeah, I'm gonna get an associate's in psychology, one in sociology, and one in behavioral sciences, and I believe Jesse will probably have the same. And then we're going to, yeah, so we're, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, but we're lining ourselves up to have successful careers after prison. Yep. A lot, Good. A lot of people, a lot of people forget a lot, like you said, a lot of people that get caught in the chasing the chronos and get caught in just like yeah. trying to get out of prison. They forget yeah. the goal. The goal isn't just to get out of prison. The goal is to stay out of prison. And just, and I've seen people uh, uh, gain their freedom and not make it out there because they didn't do the work yeah. necessary to prepare yeah. themselves to the street. Yeah. They, they knew how to play lip service to the panel, but exactly. they didn't build something inside themselves that made, that made them yeah. success on the streets, you know? Yes, and that's the board is always looking for what kind of vocational skills did you guys learn while you were incarcerated because they want to make sure that you, like the college thing is huge because if you have a degree, at least they know that you can go out and get a, uh, a job with a degree because a lot of the guys are uneducated and have no, a lot of my inmates are were juveniles at the time of the crime, but um, getting a vocation and a degree is so big because then they go, okay, this guy has a way to earn money and he's not going to go back to criminal um, activity to be able to pay his bills. That's huge. Vocations are huge for the board. And the re-entry thing too, by the way, um, a lot of guys have a tendency to minimize re-entry into society, especially when they've been locked up. When I see a guy that's been locked up for 20, 30, gosh, I had one guy 39 years, um, and sometimes I'll hear you guys say, oh, I think the bit, one of the questions the board always asks, always, will be, what are the biggest, biggest challenges upon reentry? And then some of the guys will be like, oh, I think, gosh, probably reconnecting with my family or um, getting a social security. So I'll hear, like, weird things. I'm like, wait a minute. Terrible no, answers. no, no. You have been locked up for 30 years. You have had your laundry done, your food made. Everything has been delivered to you in a controlled environment. Getting out in the open, everything. I always tell my guys, please say everything will be a stressor upon re-entry. Making a basic choice because you haven't had to make a choice, remember, in 20, 30 years. Um, go to the grocery store and pick out a laundry detergent. I call it brain lockup. You're going to stand in the aisle and you can't. There's like 30 detergents. Um, go to a fast food restaurant and try to make a choice what you want off the menu. The light, the sound, and the motion of society today is stressful alone enough. Try to do a parking meter that's all digital now. You know, basic life has passed you guys up. And so a lot is digital. There's so many stressors upon re-entry that that's the list I really want. Sometimes I ask my guys, hey, come up with like 15 things that's going to be a problem, not just reconnecting with your family. Like, and when you guys go to transitionals, you're going to have a lifer there and they're going to help you get your CDL. They're going to help you get your social security card. They're going to walk you through a lot of the challenges. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. So you get that outside help when you go to transitional, but you have to recognize and tell them that you understand, hey, I got a lot of challenges because I've been locked up for X amount of time and everything's been delivered to me, you know? Yeah, that's gonna be different. I remember when I, I got out before, um, yeah, I didn't have any I didn't have any plans, any any really marketable skills, but um, I went to the supermarket, I got my paycheck 
And uh, my, I remember my mom picked me up, and she's like, well, let's spend that money on some food. You need to get some groceries because I have my own apartment. And um, I went I went with her to the store, and she started seeing what I was buying, man. I met her in the middle of the store, and I came over with my car. She had her car. She looked in, and she was like, what is this? She, I, had a, I had a peanut butter. I had like a, I had a case of soups. <laughs> some sriracha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the pr- all the prison staples. I had a bunch of refried <laughs> refried beans. Zoom zooms yeah. and like, Every, no. Yeah, everything dehydrated. Yeah, what are you getting? Yeah, <laughs> yeah but no, yeah, it's, it's just different, you know, because we don't realize it. I'm like, well, as long as I have soups in the shelf, I'm never gonna go hungry, you know. <laughs> and yeah. I was getting like, I was getting the most expensive, the, the most expensive, um, like a uh, uh, produce and the, the steak side because I wanted steak. And it's just like, look, so I'm going to take you over here to this side of the aisle. She goes, this stuff, you have to freeze it right away because there, it's marked down. So you're going to get quality meat, but you got to freeze it, you know. So she gave me a little tip on that, you know. And uh, so yeah. it's way better than the stuff you were eating in there. And then she took you to a farmer's market. Oh, my gosh. That's how I love that place. Le queda un restante de 60 segundos. I had never heard of the farmer's favorite. market, and I walked in there to smell good in there and all kinds of fresh yeah. greens and green onions. I was, <laughs> I was blown away. I was like, oh, my gosh, everything's so colorful and green. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, I love <laughs> it was amazing. Hey, uh, James, yeah. you, want give us, you want to give me a call back on the, on the video call right now? You know what? Um. Uh, 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 I, I'm not able to. I'm not able to load funds, and, and Ms. Vero just put that that uh, the system's down for funding, so that's why I'm not able to fund it up right now. But okay. you, you go ahead and call back, and, and we'll keep on running it like that. I'll give you a call back right now. Okay. All right. All right. Cool. Perfect. Hello, Lisa. Yeah. So I was trying to add some more money to the man. It's because I sh- I should probably be adding larger amounts of money, but any time for for the video visits, I normally add ten dollars. Uh, and it, yeah. it'll last me like a week or whatever. But uh, uh, the, the reason I don't like I, I don't like putting large amounts of money on there is because in the past, what GTL would do if you don't use that account, they'll end up like if you don't use it for within like 90 days, they'll end up they end up taking your cash. So so uh, I, I did a mental note to myself that yeah. I would I wouldn't let that happen to me in the future. So uh, so it, it's working, but it's not working now for, wow. for situations like this when when I need to. Uh, They've know. never. That's weird. They've never taken my money. Well, probably because you always use your account. If you're always like getting calls. Global tell link. Oh, oh, this call is now being recorded. David Lopez. Un individuo encarcelado en de la prisión estatal de Centinela, Centinela, California. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. You have a prepaid call. You will not be charged for this call. Para aceptar esta llamada, diga o prima ahora el. Gracias por utilizar Global Tel Link. Hello. All right, James. Yep, James, Lisa. All right. Mm-hmm. So we do. Yep, do- that's cool. I- I'm very. I'm glad I got to meet you, Lisa. I'm, I'm very, very happy that um, just to have your support. You know, it's it's amazing. And I, especially that you guys see like what we're what we're doing here, you know. I can only speak for the people that I see. Like I live with Jesse; he's my celly. Um, I don't know if you know anything about our backstories, but Jesse Jesse's my friend. This is my friend from before prison. Um, I've known Jesse since I first moved to the desert. I moved to the desert probably at what, 13, 14 years old, and um, Jesse mm-hmm. was one of the first people that I met. And um, I know we we got into a lot of trouble together. Um, we went into the juvenile system together, and we were um, we got out, got involved in like the the same kind of um, the gang hierarchy and stuff like that. And you know, it's mm-hmm. crazy that our paths mm-hmm. collided over here, and we're both doing what mm-hmm. we're supposed to be doing. We're both we're both living a positive lifestyle. But I can, I mean, we're in the cell together. Like you know your cell, you know, and he, mm-hmm. it's it's amazing that I get to that I get to experience this with him, you know, and. Um, I was gonna say at least you have I, a good celly. You're not. <laughs> I got a good, I got a good celly. Well, yeah, because we know, yeah. you know, there's some weird cellies. I've had some weird cellies yeah. in here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I heard the story. I did. Yeah. Reception. Yeah. Hey, reception. Reception is the weirdest celly. Reception is the weirdest celly that um um I had. Right. <laughs> I've had some strange ones in reception because they just put them in there with you, and um so I get there, and I hadn't I hadn't been in S and Y before. You know, I had never been in like on this side. So when I came out of reception, I was just, I mean, when I came out of county jail, um, I came because I, I ended up getting in trouble um, out there, you know. So when I came to the county, I I went into to the PC side, went into 
reception is and mm-hmm. that's now and I didn't mm-hmm. know what I was gonna what I was gonna do with you know and um so my first mm-hmm. jelly, I go in there and he's like a regular dude, he's a big old tall dude, but I'm starting to see he's got some like um white supremacist tattoos and stuff like that. So I'm like, damn, this is crazy mm-hmm. because I never really lived with anybody I never lived with anybody that was other than a um other than like Hispanic or, you know, within my same regional mm-hmm. f- affiliation, you know, from the main line. Mm-hmm. And so I go with him and I'm like, all right, well, whatever, you know, so I'm chilling and he's on the top bunk and he starts talking to him. Like I hear him mumbling something and I can't, <laughs> I'm, th- I'm reading a book, you know, there's no TV and I'm like, he's, he's mumbling and he's sounding like he's saying some crazy stuff. Like he's saying some like anti-Semitic stuff and he's saying some like, he's saying some uh, satanic stuff. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I, I know I'm not tripping, you know. I'm like, I'm sitting there, mm-hmm. like, yeah, maybe I'm tripping, you know. So I stop mm-hmm. reading and I'm just listening to what he's saying, and it sounds pretty crazy. And I'm like, damn. So mm-hmm. finally, he's getting louder and louder, and he's going. And I get up and I'm like, hey, are you all right? <laughs> like, is there? Mm-hmm. No, I'm, I'm all right. I can handle myself in prison, you know. So I've been in, I've been mm-hmm. in like very minimal issues. I've had minimal issues with cellies. I've been in some cell fights in the past, you know. Cause I, like I said, I grew up in here, so I've. I've come across a lot of characters. So I get up and I'm like, mm-hmm. just, you know, just talk to the guy. I'm not tripping, you know. So I just wanted to know if I was like, if he's all right. And he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, like, are you, uh, mm-hmm. he's like, are, you know, are you, are you all right? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. all right, so you're all right. You're good. So yeah. he goes, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> so I go down and I start reading again. And sure enough, it starts small. And he's just whispering a little bit. And then I'm telling her about a Jake Tech <laughs> And I'll tell her about you. No, yeah. no, this is all. This is a story about Jesse. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. So, <laughs> so the guy starts. The guy starts whispering again, and it starts small, and he goes louder and louder. And sure enough, now he's like, he's like super like demonic now, you know. And I can hear, it and I'm like, damn, like this is kind of giving me the willies, you know. So yeah. I get up, and I'm like, I'm like, hey, uh, um, are you all right, man? You know, you could tell me, are you are you good? You need you need me to like call somebody for you or anything? He's like, what are yeah. you talking about? He looked at me, he looked at me so normal, like I was like, and he's like, are you are you okay? Do you need me to call somebody? <laughs> and I'm like, damn, wow. like, this is crazy. This and I'm starting yeah. to think in my head, like, damn, what did I do? Like, why? I mean, this is the kind of crap I'm gonna have to deal with, right? So finally, yeah. um, he does it again, and now I get up and I'm like, look, dude. This is like, you're getting so, you're so loud right now. I can't even read. I can't concentrate. Like, I can't, all I can hear is this crazy stuff you're saying. I told him, look, if you're mm-hmm. satanic, if you're anti-Semitic, like, you could do whatever you want. Like, like I don't care. I'm going to go find another place to, to live. And I said, but just like, look, yeah. if you're going to do that satanic stuff, just don't be like cutting up animals in here. Don't be rubbing blood on the walls. Like, you know, don't be like, don't be sacrificing mice. Like, don't be doing none of that, you know, like, you know, there's no, yeah. I don't know what else to tell them, you know, and then. He starts getting crazy with me, you know, like he starts getting kind of like up and kind of bossy. So um, I, I flexed up on him. The cops came and they took him out, you know, and I just felt like, man, this is just insane. These, these crazy cellies. So when I when I was here, like when I got to come here with my friend, you know, and I, I just felt like, man, I can actually kick my shoes off and I can relax. You know, I don't have to like I don't have to play yeah. dance with, with, with people in here. You know, you get in here with strangers and you don't know who you don't know. Yeah how normal they are in the yard, but you don't know what, they, what they're really like. These guys yeah. are freaking nuts. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's guys yeah. that'll go to boards like that. I know you've seen people that have gone to board, and I, I know you're an attorney, so you can't talk about any of your clients or anything like that, but I know you see some J-cats. <laughs> I know you guys see what we see. You guys come across some crazy cats, and they just, <laughs> there's some people that will go to board. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of these days yeah. you're gonna you're gonna come across a file. You're gonna come across a file on your desk, and you're gonna think about me. And be like, okay, this is the guy he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my crazy dude. <laughs> this is the, oh, this is that guy. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you want uh, yeah, you want to know the most story. disgusting thing? Of, yeah, you want to know yeah, the most ahead. crazy thing that ended with this story? Okay, so when they pull me out, right? Because me and the dude, like, I didn't want to hurt him. Like, I I honestly didn't. Like, I don't want to like pick on somebody that's um. And I was like, I wasn't where I'm in now. I, I wasn't like, I was willing to fight back then and stuff like that. But one thing I knew in my head, I was like, well, this guy's mentally hurt. You know, this guy's mentally, this guy's got mental problems and I didn't feel right. Like hitting him or anything like that, you know? So when he got crazy with me, I did, I, I punched on him. I punched on him, but I like kind of stopped. I just kind of wanted to make a scuffle to where the cops would come mm-hmm. and separate us, you know? Mm-hmm. And 
they put mm-hmm. me in a shower, they put me in a shower, and they put him in a shower. So, you know, they have to lock showers. So when they took okay. me and they walked me by his shower, the cops asking me what happened, and I'm explaining it to him. I'm like, this guy lost his freaking mind. You know, this guy okay. did some crazy stuff, and I honestly, yeah, this guy, and they're like, no, I don't think he would do that. And when we walked by his shower, as God is my witness, we said, this guy was, this guy looked like he was possessed by the devil. He was like yelling, like, ah, like all crazy, like some poltergeist shit, right? Like an exorcist. And he- Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. He was licking the shower walls in the floor. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Yeah. Do you know how disgusting? Do you know how disgusting yeah. these walls are? They are. Yeah. He should be. He should be in the mental health system. He should be either EOP or this, something. This this dude should be in EOP. This dude. Yeah. When they seen it, all of us. I mean, you know when you're getting escorted. You know when you're getting escorted. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but when you're escorted, they're taking you from point A to point B. Like you're handcuffed, you yeah. got two officers on you, and they're calling escorts, and you're getting walked across the yeah. yard. You're going to a cage. It was a, yeah. like they stopped the escort with me cuffed <laughs> up, and we all were just staring at the shower, just looking at the guy, like, "What the hell?" Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. That uh. was. Yeah. So, who knows where that guy's at? You know. Yeah, that, yeah. Guy, that guy's definitely EOP. But that's yeah, just what they do, though. That's the kind of... Those... Yeah. Yeah, he needs help. You know, he needs an exorcist. Yeah. He needs a priest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Probably. Probably. I don't think a doctor... I don't think a doctor's going to help, help that. that guy. You know? He needs, he needs the priest. local... <laughs> I was going to say, he needs the chaplain priest. Yeah. He needs, a, he needs to call a parent or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that guy that's, was freaking... That's not a... That's you know, beyond yeah, that guy was health. that guy was crazy. No, that's beyond yeah. right there. That was like demonic, but it was just kind of it was kind of crazy, you know. Yeah, it was. And that can ruin your whole ride. Hey, can you getting a bad belly like that? That can I can really screw you up. Well, there's people there's people that have killed their cellies in here. You know, there's yes, people that have killed yeah, their cellies. There's yeah. people that have yeah. You know? I've heard some and horror so stories it's, it's, about that. Hey, we hear it all the time. Like, and I've seen. I've seen crazy stuff with cellies, you know, like, not me, but I've seen my neighbors and stuff, and I've seen some crazy stuff in here where, you know, some really, really bad cell fights that I'm surprised the guy lives. Um, I've seen guys get hogtied before. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. I've seen a guy, I've seen a guy come out um, hogtied. Um, yeah, it's nuts. Hey, you know, is it yeah. really loud in here? Can you guys, can you guys hear? Is there a lot of interference? I can hear you. No, it's not bad. I can hear yeah, you. Hey, uh, okay. uh, you know how you were talking about that guy licking uh, the floor? Uh, Chubby Jessica writes, maybe it was a yeah. humiliation ritual, or maybe he was joining a, a new S, new, new STG. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know what you were saying. Hey, so I, I, floor so Jesse just walked up. We're in the day room. We're in the day room right now, so Jesse just wandered off right now, but he's back. So yeah. I told her about this, that J-Cat dude that was looking, I'm explaining this to Jesse, that the J-Cat dude was licking the shower walls and everything all crazy. Yeah, I got into it in the cell. I had a I he had to go. I not tell anybody about that. I told you. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just exposed Jesse's uh, deepest. That's not even one of his deepest secrets. That's like on the, that's a surface. That's on the surface with him. No, so, no, um, Chubby Jessica said that that guy was trying to join a new STG. And I want to know what the name <laughs> the guy of. guy was licking the shower? Yes. I want to know what the name of that STG would be called. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's got to be darker. This guy was insane. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know the name of that guy's gang. Yeah, sure. So if I ever come across them, I'll run. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't want no, I don't want no smoke with anybody who's licking showers for a living. I don't want, I, I, I avoid it's gang members now, but I don't run from them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I try to stay away from gang members as a whole, but it's a special breed that are licking showers. Yeah. Right. I will run I will run from them. That's funny. No, but those there's some crazy people in here, you know. What's your what's your best J Cat story, Jess? And not yours. I'm talking about anything different. And don't tell her any of mine. (laughs) You know me a long time. Man, I, I, you, I think this is probably one of the craziest things that I've seen was in the county jail. I was in, I was in, uh, uh, in Aztec. Yeah. And they used to, for a while there, they were putting the J-Cats in Aztec with us, you know, and, yeah. and, and uh, 
And it was literally, it, it was crazy because at one time we had three of them back there. And I lit, I go up to a door one time just to like look in just for just to be nosy, you know. Because yeah. I know he's a weirdo and I just want to see what's going on in the weirdo cell, you know. And I, <laughs> and I look in there and I kid you not, this cat's in there playing cards. By, he has no cards, right? He has no cards. But he, it looks like he's playing cards. It looks like he's smoking dope and he's having a full conversation with some chicks. And it was just, and I'm like, I'm sitting there, and I'm, and I'm, so now I'm watching. I'm like, okay, how far is this gonna go? And he's literally like, it was, a, it was a, it was the craziest thing I've seen. But th- I, that week I went to court, and they have the stand-up cages for all the ad cigs. At the time, remember they had them out in front of. I remember. Yeah, I remember. Well, we're, we're all in the stand-up cages, and it's me and two of those J cats, the ones that used to talk to themselves. And I swear to God, it sounded like there was at least six people, eight people out there, and it was just us three. And I'm not talking. These two cats were having a conversation with themselves, and it sounded like three different, not to each other, but with their own conversations amongst themselves and whatever voices they had in their head. And I swear to God, it sounded like six people were out there talking. I was like, what the, what is this, a twilight zone? They were in deep. Yeah, that's probably the craziest thing that I, I mean, I see some pretty crazy shit, but that one right there was the one that stuck with me for a long time. Chino, Chino Palm Hall is where, like, Chino Palm Hall is where they had a good assortment of J-Cats. Like, there was a good, like, there was a Skittles, <laughs> a good yeah. assortment. But, um, Alpine. <laughs> that was, no, like, in Palm Hall, like, um, the overflows, it's always in the overflows. You know, like, Cypress Hall or Birch Hall, you know, that would be the Atsig overflow building. But they have some crazy ones, you know. And I was in a place, um, Lisa, I don't know, have you ever, have you ever heard anything about Chino Prison? Not too much. All right, so there was a place, there was a place in Chino Prison. Um, okay, so they have Palm Hall, which is like the, it's like the old, the old school ad thing, you know, and I was a Palm Hall baby. I lived there for a long time when I, I had an indeterminate shoe before. But um, I had, I had done a huge incident when I was on the main line, and I thought they were going to take me in a Palm Hall, and instead they took me across into Cypress Hall, into some place called uh, Deep Segregation. Le queda un restante de 60 segundos. I had never heard of deep segregation before. That place was a freaking madhouse down there. there that, that place changed my life. Like, honestly, I, I think a piece of me is still down there somewhere. <laughs> piece of you died over there? Right. Hey, Lisa, yeah, when, yeah. We, when we call back right now, I want, I want to ask you a few questions about the board process. I want to, I want to, I want to get, get a little insight from yeah. you. Yep. I'm going to, I'm going to give a call back. Yeah. The phone's going to hang up right now. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right, Lisa, thank you. I, I, pre, I appreciate you, um, you know, for calling in and, 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 the, and these gentlemen are going to get, uh, you know, to those uh, board questions that, uh, that I'm sure a lot of a lot of you know their, their counterparts back there are, are definitely in uh, uh, definitely looking forward to you know hearing the answers to because uh, yeah uh, I mean ultimately I mean that's the way they're they're able to go you know able to go, go home is once you know they go in front of the board and the board finds them suitable mm-hmm. so so I'm sure uh, um, you know their 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 the group of gentlemen that that they hang around with I'm I'm sure um, they have some questions for 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 you and i'm sure they're going to use them to to ask those questions so i'm definitely looking forward to to hear what uh, uh jesse are you at um are you in centinella today or calipatria is this centinella yeah this is uh this is centinella yeah uh-huh yeah. awesome okay yeah, yeah. all right they're calling back in this call is now being recorded global tell link usted tiene una llamada prepagada de david lopez un individuo encarcelado en de la prisión estatal de Centinela, Centinela, California. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. You have a prepaid call. You will not be charged for this call. Para aceptar... Gracias por utilizar Global Tel Link. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so quick question. So, uh... Myself, I, I'm, I'm a certified paralegal. I got cert- well, not certified. I guess I, I got a paralegal diploma, but um, Good. I'm not, not a certified. But I did, I did get certified through Blackstone. But um, what was I going to say? Uh, uh, so what, I wanted to ask you, uh, what what made you get into uh, bo- becoming a board prep attorney? I'm sure you were an attorney previously, and and ultimately decided to come down this lane. What made you get into uh, a board uh, BPH counsel? Hmm. That's a very good question. Um, 
I was doing other areas. My girlfriend that I went to law school with, she was a public defender. And she is a public defender in Northern California, and she got hooked up with DPH. And she was trying to talk me into it for a couple of years, and I was like, yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty gullible. <laughs> I don't know if uh, this will fit me well. And then um, I actually had, you know, I have a, some familial experience with the uh, prison system, and I'm aware of what it's like once you guys get out, the problems with parole and probation and all that stuff. But, um, you know, I kind of started it to see what it was like, and then I found it was a really good fit for me because I don't have to pretend to be some buttoned-up lawyer that talks a certain way, that I can actually be who I am, and you guys understand me, and I can kind of understand you guys better. I, I do have a tendency to drop some f bombs which you know i try to be good about but that's kind of who i am it just seems to fit for me i think i i, I get what you guys are at and sometimes my friends will ask me well how are you doing this isn't this scary and i'm like no um all of these guys are like broken little I, like i kind of look at you because what happens is that there's a left turn that happened when you guys were kids and your childhood trauma is the yeah. thing that is why you're in prison and so something broke back then i mean we're all broken human beings and i fully admit this truth of myself but you guys are all like broken little boys kind of is how i look at you guys and i'm like okay they just got they took a left turn somewhere but they can get back on the road if they just rewire their brain for pro-social thinking everything is possible so a long story short i mean you know it's just it's, I don't know. It just kind of came my way. And I was working with the veterans at the Los Angeles County Bar Association and doing um, um, expungements and 1385 motions. So I just kind of tiptoed over here, and I, and I like it. It works for me. You know, it depends on the lawyer. It's probably, right, right. It's probably kind of fulfilling. And, and I, I could totally relate and understand what you talked to, like about being a buttoned-up lawyer, because... Uh, I actually took my murder to trial myself. I was pro per. I went to trial, wow. and I did what three what three previous attorneys and two separate trials were unable to do. All my crimes got life without the possibility of parole, and like I had the first time. I went to trial the first time, got LWAP. I went back on appeal, wow. and I went pro per, and I took it to trial myself, and I got a second degree murder for what was a contract murder. So, um, and I understand yeah. what you're talking about because when I, when I was at when I was actually going in there and I'm trying to present myself in the same way that the district attorney was presenting himself, like I was trying to, like... Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. And, and it, was, it was becoming, like, stressful for me because that's not who I was. And I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't go in there and take my case to trial for the sake of winning my case. I took my case to trial because... I had control issues, and I said, if anybody's going to throw my life away, it's going to be me. I'm not going to give it to some attorney. And I basically went in there like, mm -hmm. I already have LWAP. What are they going to do? Give me? Because at the time, I had life right. without the possibility of parole. So so I was like, you know what? I got old. nothing to lose and, and everything to gain. I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to have fun with this. But when I when I got through the process, for the, the three years or two years prior to actually going to trial, I started to realize, hey, you know what? I can actually do something here. I'm finding a bunch of things that these other lazy ass attorneys hadn't done in the past. You know, yeah. so I uh, uh. and that's a but, shame but because the there is a lot of problems. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I hear, I hear you. There's a, there, I, I, I hate to say it, but there are a lot of attorneys out there that don't get the job done, and they end up taking the money and stringing you guys along. I've heard inmates. Hire private attorney. I'm a state board appointed attorney, by the way. I'm not a private I attorney. It. I mean, I take public places. But I've heard inmates, my inmates have come to me and said, look, I paid this guy X amount of dollars, and he's done nothing for me. And so it's a shame. I get it. It, it, it. I feel really bad for a lot of you guys that are spending money and, and stuff like that. It sucks. And if you right, have the ability right. but you know what's crazy. to go to paralegal school, do it and represent. I mean, it, a lot of times we would say don't go pro per unless you have the brains to be able to manage that situation which you do but not a lot of guys do you know so good for you right right and thank you i appreciate that and it's crazy because I went, when i was done trying to be prime and proper and, and prim inside that courtroom i said you know what man 
just go in here and have a good time. That's, that's basically what I told myself because I was stressing myself out trying to stick to a specific script, trying to like sound like the district Mm-mm. attorney. And the reality of it was Mm-mm. is these jurors, they, they, they couldn't get themselves out of jury duty. So these people, they didn't want to hear a bunch of court talk. They wanted me, they wanted me to go in there and present myself. Who, and, and that was what I did. I, I literally went in there and I, I, did, I, I spoke the way I would on any normal day. I made it clear to them, hey, who you see in this courtroom is not who I am outside of this courtroom. And, and they respected it because Good. that's just the reality of it. Like I, I, you know, and, and they gave me, I ended up getting found guilty of second degree murder, you know, which, which should have never happened because Good. the reality of it is I'm in prison for a first degree murder. I, I'm, the Good. sense that I had initially was the sense that I had coming to me. But hey, things happen the way they happen for a reason, and I thank God for the, the opportunity and the chance to get out of prison again one day and, and be able to go before the board. And because of that, I'm going to make sure that I'm doing everything I have to do to honor the man whose life I took, you know. And so, yeah. I wanted to, I, I wanted to ask you. Uh, okay, so I, I was I was a validated associate, right? I, I, before I came to the S and Y side, I came from the shoe, you know, and, and all that stuff, and. and I, so when I went for my initial hearing, they didn't ask anything about my my debrief. They didn't ask anything about all my past, uh, you know, uh, gang activity. Do you think on my next hearing that that's something that I'm going to have to deal with? Because this hearing, they, they really didn't even talk about my life crime. They didn't talk about anything. What they did talk about was my disciplinary history within the last five years. I had three years without a write-up, but I had nine write-ups in the two years prior to that. And then I had a, you know, I had a, like I said, I had a bunch of activity and she basically said, look, I see where you're at. I see what you're doing. That's awesome. You know, like continue on this path, but we're here to determine if you pose a future risk. And because you've had a, a, such an extensive disciplinary history, you, you mm-hmm. obviously pose a risk. We, we need a minimum of five years and, and anything within five years is recent to us. And so, um, do you think that when I go back later on that I'm going to have to address all the stuff that I did for the prison gang prior to uh, dropping out? Um, here, so every every panel, because it's two people, it's a commissioner and a deputy commissioner, every panel is different. What this one panel went over this last round may be different than the next panel is going to go over. And what they do sometimes is they ta- kind of take – chunks and pieces of your life. Like if institutional behavior was the biggest thing that stuck out for them, then they're going to handle that. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. And then what's going to happen is that there's going to be, uh, obviously you get the transcripts for this. And so the next panel is going to he- hear and see, they're going to read everything that you guys talked about in this panel. Now, there's, we don't know, anything can come up, but there is, a, if they handled your institutional behavior in round one, there might be, there, they might be checking out other areas for you and saying, okay, well, okay, we got his institutional behavior cleared up. Now let's see where he's at with his STGs. And let's, and maybe they may talk about this. There's no guarantee of what they will or will not talk about, but if they haven't talked about it, it might be open fodder for them to investigate another area of your life. And they'll say, okay, well, let's see. We got the institutional behavior down. Okay, we feel good about that. Now let's go and find out where he's at with his SCGs. Did he debrief? Is it part of it? Is there any RVRs that show any kind of SCG contraband or SCG activity? And then they may investigate that area because they want to make sure all of the areas of your life have been dealt with. So if your institutional behavior is now good, then maybe they were going to look and, and delve into the STG thing. And at which point, you just own all of it, right? Even if you were, I don't care if you were like, you have the keys to the yard or if you're a shot caller. I don't care what level of the totem pole you're on. You have to own all of it, right? Because they actually end up, they know more about you guys than you know about themselves. They know more than I know. They have files that I can't see. Obviously, I can't see confidentials and I can't see waiting lists that you guys are on. There's certain things I can't see, but they know everything. So also remember this. When they ask you a question, there's a good possibility they already have the answer, but they're just asking you to see what you're going to say. They want to see how honest and credible that you guys are going to be, too. That's part of the whole process of rehabilitating your brain, you know? Right, right. Because they know know a criminal is going to live in denial. Yes. Yes, and minimize and rationalize and do all the right. things that, you know, everything but taking accountability and ownership for your past actions. Um, 
Je right. Jessica wrote on here, she wrote, because I said something and I want to retract it. She wrote, I think they should not be seen as boys. They are men and should be seen as adults with responsibilities. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, Jessica. When these guys are raised in their home life and it's either their parents that are either drug addicts or gang members or their parents are working so often that these small children are going to the streets and finding love and acceptance in the streets. So what happens is when they're growing up during their childhood, the trauma set in back then. So their brain was wired to think criminal thinking was normal. So back then they broke. We all are not whole people. All of us have issues. But all of these guys had trauma at a very young age. Like I had one guy that was nine years old carrying a gun. So when you start really young at that thing, there your growth has been stinted. And so that's why prison has all these rehabilitation programs to rewire the thinking that broke back then. So yes, absolutely, you guys are all adults with new responsibilities and I respect the fact that you guys are cleaning up your lives. This is amazing. But you guys, a majority of you are have all this childhood trauma that don't know how, children cannot process trauma. This is the biggest thing about the board. Here's, here's the biggest meat. Children cannot process trauma. So whatever you suffer, Jesse and, and your, and your Sally and everybody, you as a child, you cannot process that. I guarantee you didn't go to therapy when you're a little boy. I guarantee you didn't have somebody to talk to, to express your emotions and how this hurt you and that hurt you. So what you guys do is you, you bottle up this trauma and you bury it. And then what happens is that it comes out in the form of rage and violence and criminal thinking and gang activity. So that's what happens back that's then. And we have to Marty, Marty, it work? Yeah. So we're just trying to we. It's not that I'm saying you guys are all boys, little boys, but back when you were children, things went south, and so now we're the no, we prison and rehabilitation is trying to teach you how to rewire your brain because you are adults and you are grown men and you do need to go into society, but you have to be pro-social now. Not that's why we're rewiring your brain to say, hey, use your words instead of your fist because. Some mothers didn't say that to their little children back then. They can say, honey, that's not how you handle your problems. Use your words and, you know, not your fist, blah, blah, blah. Right. So it's not that I'm saying you guys are broken. You guys are bo children. You're not. But you were broken back then, as most of us human beings are. I'm not saying inmates are different than civilians. Civilians just didn't get caught or whatever. You know, I'm just, you know. But the point is right. we were all right. had trauma at some, at some form when we were a child. So I just wanted to correct that. No, I, 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 totally, I totally agree with you. It's, it's, a, it's a state of arrest and development that most of us live with. Yeah. And I could be the first one to say that at, at, th at 39 years old, I was the same kid I was when I was 13, 14, 15 yes. years old. I acted. Yes. I, I, I may have matured. I, I may have yes. matured criminally. I may have become criminally sophisticated. But my yes. emotional intelligence and my and, yes. and I, I was still the 15-year-old kid yes. that I was when, at 39 years old. So so I understand that's, what you're talking about. And, 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 and I want to get broken well into my 30s. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I appreciate, tell Jessica, tell Jessica that I appreciate her chiming in. And I definitely... Le queda un restante de 60 segundos. For the first time in my life, do I actually feel like I'm like a real man? For the first time in my life, I'm being responsible. Yeah. I'm not getting. Yeah. I'm, I'm not. I'm not being controlled by by my emotions. Sure. You know, I know how yes. to make responsible decisions. I know how to set goals. I know how to follow through with my obligations. So now I am a man today, but I totally get it. When I was 39 years old, I was a I was a kid still. Hey, you know. Yes. Right now. We'll go ahead Hold on. We're gonna call back. We're gonna call back right now. Okay. All right. All right. Cool. Thank you. All right, uh, Lisa. So, uh, uh, yeah. uh, is there any other information that 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 uh, that you want to share with us? With with you know, because I know you sent me that that AB six hundred. Anything that the the viewers should know about these uh, when filling out these petitions? Or because I know earlier on you said it's, it's not guaranteed. You know that they yeah. are going to be be able to get it back into court, even though they 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 um they fill out these forms. Right. So with these, sometimes like I. I had a guy, I have a guy over at Calipatria that was in the D yard. He was, I'm sorry, the C yard, the C yard. And he was the legal beagle for that building. Um, hopefully, the best thing to do is see, it's, it's a, go ahead. Sorry about that. No, no, it's go ahead. Global Telling. This call is now being recorded. David Lopez.
Un individuo encarcelado en de la prisión estatal de Centinela, Centinela, California. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. You have a prepaid call. You will not be charged for this call. Para aceptar esta llamada, diga o prima ahora el 5. Gracias por utilizar Global Tel Link. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we're back. All right. Right. Now, she, she hit it right on, and, and we know that, and it took us a long time to admit, hey, we were, we were affected by the things that happened to us when we were kids. You know, when I, was, when I went on the podcast, I didn't want to air out dirty laundry as far as um, Trauma. With family, with them, just so I, I, I carefully maneuvered around that and kind of just went into where my incarceration started. But... There, yeah, there's absolutely. All of us came from very dysfunctional. Homes. Absolutely, I had a lot of dysfunction growing up, you know, tons of it, and I was, I was extremely traumatized when I was a kid. Um, I did not have the. They didn't know how to love me when I was a child, and I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted, but I knew that I wasn't getting what I wanted at home, and I did. I started out in the gang. I gravitated towards other crazy kids, you know. Mm -hmm. That's just it led me down a, a lifetime of, you know, a lifetime of just heartbreak you know and my my wife i'm married now you know and my wife she had a lot to do with who i am today she put in okay. the work you know and i didn't meet my wife in here there's you know, we call it there's mwi which is met well incarcerated um, mm. and i don't i don't want to put anything like and say like oh people who met you know people while they were incarcerated it's not going to work because it's not for me to say but i know my mm. particular situation you know i i know my wife from out of society and My wife always believed in me, and she always looked for things in me that I didn't see in myself. And it was her love that actually got me wanting to get clean, wanting to stay clean. You know, I got clean. I got clean on after a dirty drug test. I wasn't. I wasn't planning on staying clean. My wife. My wow. wife came in and intervened at the right time back in 2016. I got a. I got a use of methamphetamine in 2016, and I was on mandatory drug tests after that. So I had no choice but to stay clean. You know, I mean, I had a choice. I could have lost my visits for yes. a year. You know, I could have, I could have continued on that path. But I looked at it like they would have been stupid to, you know, to lose my visits for a year. So <laughs> I was actually, I got, I stayed clean because of that. And well, I got clean because of that, and I stayed clean because of my wife. And now I'm clean yeah. for myself. I'm not clean for. I don't stay clean because of my wife now. I don't stay clean because of family. I stay clean because I don't find my value in other things. I find my value within myself now. And I have no desire to use drugs anymore. I feel like I've healed from the reasons why I was using drugs in the first place. You know, and, and remember, uh, the, big wife, thing, was, the big thing yeah, with the ahead. board is when you guys talk about, that's the other thing, because what I, I always try to remind you guys, why are we, not we, but you know what I mean, why are you doing drugs? Why do human nature does drugs? Because we're masking a yeah. pain, right? That's what alcohol is. That's what sure. all these drugs do. They mask a pain. And that goes back to your childhood trauma. So that's why we trace everything back to your childhood. And when there's large drug uses, sometimes I can look back at the CFA or the CRA, the criminal risk assessment, and look at that guy's childhood and go, wow, this guy had. Sometimes I call an inmate the, the, tra the trifecta of trauma. It's one thing to have trauma from like, the family life and your childhood, but you can get trauma from yeah. several other avenues too. Like maybe you're abused. Maybe you witness a friend, your, your family member die in your arms. Like the trauma that you guys go through with this kind of lifestyle is not the trauma that normal people suffer. You know, it's, it's extra. It's yeah. super extra. So it, yeah. you know, it takes a lot to, and yeah, Jessica, they, they, they do have choices in these. They absolutely do. And that's why a lot of them are in here because they made the wrong choices. And now they're trying to figure out how to make the right choices. You know, that, that's, that's the reality of it. And that's, like, so that's why when you were explaining that about the, the trauma, like that's, that's the biggest obstacle to get over because as soon as we can start mm -hmm. to process and heal and forgive mm -hmm. from that trauma, we can start to, be, we can start to genuinely develop our, our, our cognitive positioning as exactly. an adult, you know what I mean? Because we've got to remember exactly. everything that we think and everything we believe and all our reactions, they're all based on that childhood. They're all based yes. on the beliefs and, 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 the, and the experiences. 
But when we when we get past that, it's easy for us to be able to say, okay, you know what? Today, uh, today I'm, I'm making a decision from who I am today. I'm not being driven yeah. by what what a, a distorted belief from the past, you know. And so I, I was one of those people. You know what I mean? I I had a very traumatic childhood, very traumatic childhood. You know, and, and oh, it was okay. like I, I I created I created all these masks for myself so that I could face life mm-hmm. because of reality. For me, it was it was a scary place, you know. So, and, and those masks mm-hmm. became who I was. And that's how I became such a violent, selfish, careless, you know, impulsive yeah. individual. Because to me, that's what worked. You know, anything that prevented yep. me from having to face life on life's terms, that's where I was at. You know. Yep. Yep. And I also have yeah, to tell you, it yeah, is difficult for you guys to go. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm listening. Thank you. Listen. Go ahead. What were we gonna say, Lisa? Go ahead. Oh, I was just telling you that sometimes when I interview my, my clients, a lot of the guys don't want to talk or feel bad talking about their parents because their parents didn't know either. We all learn as, and grow as even parents do. So I always say, look, this isn't about um, you're not telling on your mom and dad. You're explaining where you come from because the rest of the world doesn't understand having a drug addict mother, a drug addict father that's handing his son a gun at nine years old and saying, go out. I had, you know, the stories that I hear about parents, what they do to their children, it's devastating. And the rest of us don't understand. So you, you have to, it's not minimizing, it's explaining. You know what I mean? It's explaining, hey, this is where I come from. I didn't have a lot, and the board understands children cannot, they use the word extricate, remove themselves. You can't remove yourself from your household as a small child. You have to put up with it. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. And so putting up with it means changing your brain to criminal thinking, and that becomes normal for you guys. It, it, it's just normal. It's not right. even, like, it's hard, it, yeah. And so when we talk about causative factors, remember how they go, what are your triggers? What are your causative factors? You know when they ask you those questions? Yep. The, the causative factors, yep. well, yeah, yeah. And I, I usually give a, a list out to in my pull packet to the guys. One says possible causative factors and one says triggers. And it's emotions. It's, you know, a feeling of worthlessness. It's PTSD. It's powerlessness. It's hopelessness. If you were battered as a child, you're betrayed, you're hopeless, you're powerless, you're overwhelmed, you're frustrated, you're like there's so many emotions that those are the triggers. Do you know what I mean? No, I think let me ask you a question. And it's funny it's, what, would, what would be your what would be your interpretation of positive versus contributing factors? Contributing um what do you that? say? What would you say? Okay. What, what is the because there's a difference, right? Every there in here Everybody goes, works on positive factors, and everybody works on contributing factors, and they're two separate aspects, right? But there's a lot of debate about which one is which. So for me, my, like the way that I was thinking when they asked what are my causative factors, that's causative factors to my life crime? That's internal. Causative factors yeah. are internal. Yeah. Which contributing yeah. factors are external. I was, a, I was a violent gang member and drug dealer that cared more about my status and reputation than I did about human life. That's, no, that's yeah. a contributing factor. That's causative contributing factor, factor. Causative factors are the trauma that you experienced that sh- shaped you into that person. What caused me to... What, yeah, what, what caused you... So yours would be childhood experience, yeah, uh, childhood, childhood trauma. trauma yours would be criminal yeah. thinking. Yeah. Anything that's internal is causative factor, yeah. you know? And contributing is the things that are outside, so negative influences. Go ahead. A causative, I have, I'm going to send, James, I'm going to send you the list of, um, I have a list of positive, uh, causative factors from the law office, law office of Gail Hummel. We, we compile a lot of, a, a lot of attorneys work together. I'm with a group called Parole Justice Works, and all these attorneys put their information on a share file, and I can grab stuff here or there. This one I found in an inmate um, parole packet with possible causative factors sheet, and it has stuff like prior, and by the way, some guys are sexually abused as children, and that has a detrimental lifelong effect on them. But it'll say, like, prior sexual abuse, uh, just what you said, feelings of entitlement, anger management issues, feeling betrayed, afraid to be alone, feeling helpless, powerlessness, a strong need for approval, you're fearful, um, you need to be in control, you're afraid to look weak. 
Because if you're afraid to look weak, that's a causative factor. Because guess what you're going to do? Then you're going to go out and be the badass and go p- beat somebody up and not look weak. If you're afraid to look weak, then you're going to go fight, right? So it doesn't look like you're weak. That's a causative factor, your fear of weakness. Um, depression, anxiety, um, no conflict resolution. Like, yes, low self-esteem, codependency, feelings of worthlessness. Because if you feel worthless... You need to exasperate that and, and, and show that you're better than, you know, than you feel on the inside. Insecurity is a big one, you know. Like, it's the childhood stuff that is always... And, and sometimes you're going to see in the CRA... It's any... Say, so you basically it's safe to say that if any if anything inside anything that that ignites an emotional or cognitive response to something and it's usually connected yeah. to a past experience that yeah. would be causative yeah. you know how we think how we see yeah. ourselves and the contributing the contributing is anything exterior which would be like drug consumption negative peers uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know poor so influences they they st- you- stuff like that. Yeah, what they'll do is they'll ask you on the board, okay, what are your internal triggers and what are your external triggers? So internal, like you said, those are your emotions. You can't look weak. You can't be um, embarrassed on the yard or shamed or whatever. And the external ones are like, well, what are your externals? Well, my old neighborhood, the people that I used to hang out with. Um, Sometimes I say your five senses can be triggered too because, look, if you hear music, listen, listen, you know, hearing and seeing and smelling. If you hear music from the 80s and you were doing shit back then, that music's going to trigger you. If you're sitting in the day room and you're watching a football game and the beer commercial comes on and you see the beautiful condensation on that glass, that visual, that seeing it, that's going to trigger you. If you're, and, and sometimes they ask you, okay, when you're out in public, let's say X, Y, and Z happens, but let's say you're out in public and you smell marijuana. That's a sense. You're going to smell the weed. How are you going to have, where are your coping skills to rein, rein in that trigger? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, so you right. first deal with the triggers, and then they say, okay, what are your coping skills to not fall back into that pattern? So if you're smelling weed, well, I'm going to start thinking of my consequential thinking. I'm going to do belly breathing. I'm going to count to three and put my mind in another place. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to pray. You have to have coping skills in that moment, you know what I mean, that you can rattle off to the commissioners so they know that you get it. Oh, yeah, I, I'm going to do this. I'm right. going to do that. So if you don't have a plan, they're going to think, oh, he has no This plan. call and your telephone number will be monitored. Sorry about that. Uh, I think somebody, I think, I think Silas is calling in. To accept this call. Who? Say Silas? I think so. Now. I think it is. Is either Silas or, or Ricky? Yeah. Ricky, Ricky's out here. Ricky's out here. I oh, think. he is? Or he might have just went in. Yep. Why? Is it that time? You got to you gotta go on with them? No, no, no. I told them that Lisa was going to be Silas. calling in, so so he, he, I asked him to call in. Hello? Oh, is yeah. that Ricky? Hey, what's up, Jay? Oh, it, no, it's Silas. No, Silas. Silas. Oh. We don't we hey. know his voice. Hey, we're, we're, hey, what's going on? hey, we're on Silas. We're on. So we got we got Jesse. Silas. We got Jesse, David, and Lisa, and myself. So we got the the new the twenty the twenty twenty four part P line or the prison uh, party line going on right now. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. Hey, hey uh, Jesse, David, Lisa. Yep. Good morning, everybody. Yep, yep. We. Yeah, we send ours. We send ours. That's cool, man. That's good stuff. It was able to connect everybody too. Ricky was just out here a minute ago. He's actually out here right now. I don't. Yeah, I can't hear anybody else. Oh, oh, oh! You can't hear them. Uh, tell, hey, tell Ricky. Tell Ricky. I'll see him tomorrow morning. Oh yeah, he got the ducket. He got the ducket. He's gonna see you tomorrow. He told us. Okay, cool, <laughs> cool. And I know that yeah, I yeah, his attorney, yeah. but I heard so many positive things about him because he was my on my on my uh, list. I have the ability to um, meet with him tomorrow, so I was just going to meet with him and introduce myself and say hi. <laughs> yeah, so you're not going to be his attorney after all. Um, apparently, he hired a private one, which I completely encourage and agree Le with. Le queda un restante de 60 segundos. Silas. Huh? I'm a state board. I'm a state board. I can hear you. I just can't. Uh, I can't hear anybody else. See you tomorrow, but, but uh, look at hey, Ricky's on the line right here. Here goes Ricky right here. Hey, go ahead, Lisa. 
Hey, Ricky. Lisa. Matt, how Ricky. Hey. I just came in from that Matt right? day room. <laughs> yeah. Open yeah. up right here. Like. What's happening, Tyler? Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. Lisa. Yo. Can you hear Ricky? Is that Ricky? Can you hear me? It's, it's hard yeah. to hear. When there's so many people, it's hard to know which one's talking. Sorry. But Ricky, yeah. I, I'm super... I just, are you there? Can you hear me, Ricky? Oops. Hello? Uh... I can I can hear you. Oh, you know what? Sorry, sorry, Lisa. So the car, the, the sixty seconds. I, I guess it had it had announced the, the sixty seconds. So it should uh -huh. um, it sh they should be calling back right now. As soon as they call back, then then uh, we'll, we'll we'll be able to hear them. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, I'm a state board appointed attorney, and he came across my uh, desk as being one of the guys going to board on in September. They give us inmates five to six months prior to the board and and we try to prepare them in that time zone but then i got a notice that he hired a private attorney which i'm super stoked on i i've encouraged that behavior too um but because he came across because he was assigned to me originally i have the ability to to set a hearing or an interview with him not necessarily in this case an interview but i, I had the ability to say hey let me let's meet this guy <laughs> let me see what it's about <laughs> This call is now being recorded. Global Telling. Usted tiene una llamada propagada de... David Lopez. Un individuo encarcelado en... De la prisión estatal de Centinela, Centinela, California. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. You have a prepaid call. You will not... Gracias por utilizar Global Telling. Hey, are, are, you guys, are you guys still in the day room? Yeah. Okay, so uh Battle five five nine just told me that it's working again. I'm I'm gonna try to add some funds right now so we could uh if possible we'll 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 have you guys jump back jump back on. So give me a moment and uh I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute it out and, and I'll let you guys talk to Lisa and Ricky I think Ricky was on, right? Or you guys were gonna put Ricky on? Yeah, it... it's on right now. Okay, okay. I'm here. Hey Ricky <laughs> Hey What's happening, Lisa? Hey, Hey, Ricky, I know, I, it's so funny, I, I, when I got up this morning, I meant to text James, I said, hey, James, let, if, if you can talk to Big Joe, let them know that I have an appointment with you tomorrow, and I know that you hired a private, and I'm super stoked on you for doing that, I totally encourage that behavior, but I also figured, because I heard uh -huh. some positive things about you, that I was like, you know what, let me just set up an yeah. appointment with you, and let's see what he's all about, and let me, let me sit there and have a social hour, yeah. we're going to have a social hour instead of, like, whatever, but... Yeah. Man, they mentioned your name a couple of times. I'm like, wait a minute. I I rem I know that uh -huh. name. It came across my desk, and I was like, hey, okay, good. So good. I'm I, glad that you uh, are, you know, doing doing well. I heard positive things about you, so I'm super stoked on you. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I got the the mail that you sent, and I got to say, I was telling Jesse about it the other day. That's some really good information that you sent for us. So we can have it in our oh, little you got community my parole here. Packet. Yeah, your parole packet. And, and, okay, uh, really you know what? Thank you. There. Thank you very yeah. much. And this is all coming from attorneys. So I was telling um, James and the guys that I'm part of a group called Parole Justice Works, and that's over 50 attorneys that get together every three weeks yeah. and we sit there and we try to talk about how we can help you. So the work that the, my parole package is a compilation of these attorneys that have been doing this for 20, 30 years. These women and men are yeah. extremely experienced. You're going to see in my parole packet, Ricky, and maybe share this with the guys because that's what we were just talking about. I gave you a list called possible causative factors and another separate page called triggers. This is the thing that yeah. I notice a lot of guys have a hard time understanding. So that, that possible causative factors page you know, share that so they understand that, look, um, all of this stuff is building up to why you guys have the anger and the violence. Because, I, like I said, you can't manage the trauma as a child. You know, you don't go to therapy yeah. to talk about your harms that your family, your neighborhood, or whatever traumas you suffered. I've heard horrors, horrible stories about where some of you guys come from. It's it, it put tears in my eyes, and I'm like, man. 
Where else yeah. did these kids end up? You know, so. Yeah, the commissioner. The commissioner even told me in my hearing. She even said after reviewing hey, your Franklin hearing, she goes, "It's no yes." Uh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, the the funds are in. So if, if uh, David wants to call, uh, video visit, then then we're good to go. We're gonna take Ricky over there so Ricky can video visit and meet Lisa. Okay, all right. Hey, cool. But look at it. It's no. You want to video visit? Okay. It's no wonder. Hey, the, the the commissioner was saying it's no wonder that I was sitting in front of her that I didn't even have an opportunity as a child after reviewing my Franklin. So they 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 definitely emphasized, you know. And I had a very conservative commissioner, you know. Mm. Okay. Good. Well, the Franklins helped. I had I had I had I had, Mar I had Mary Thornton. Uh-huh, 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 very conservative, yeah. She's, she's cool. But she, she told said, me, yeah. yes, no, she, she was fair, but she basically yeah. told me, she said, look, man, after going, after going over your childhood, uh, uh, you know, it, it's yeah. no wonder you're sitting in front of me. You know, you never, you never, had, an yeah. you never had an opportunity. It, so, exactly, yeah. that's what I'm trying to say is that, man, I read these childhood traumas, and sometimes I'm like in tears for you guys. Like, Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. And, and a lot of us don't understand that childhood trauma because, you know, we come, thank God I had good parents too, but that's why we want you to explain your childhood to the board so they can understand. And when there is a Franklin at the hearing, it does add a little bit of leniency with the in the commissioner's mind. They handle you a little bit more with kid gloves, you know what I mean, rather than just being like a full-blown adult that's out there making all kinds of horrendous criminal choices. As a child, you just, you really don't have a lot of control over your situation. Turn it off. Your day why? Huh? Yeah, they, he does that sometimes, though. When they turn him off sometimes at 11, we can't get through. James, we're not going to be able to get through. They turned the video business off already. Okay. Hey, no worries. No, well, that, well, I got some funds uh, for next time, so it'll 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 be sitting there. Thank, thanks, anyways. Yeah, David. David's holding uh, holding the tablet, and leading us around the day room right now. <laughs> yeah, David's David escorting us with the tablet. That's yeah. right. But no, man, this has been this, this has been a great this has been a great session. It's been cool, man. I appreciate uh, I appreciate Lisa giving us this time and and. and this opportunity to be able to share this, and, and Ricky has been telling us about that packet you sent him, and, and and just know that we all are in here doing this work. So like, we're, we're, you know, we, we share this information. We we definitely study the commissioners, we study the attorneys, we study all the different stuff that attorneys send us, and we're trying to be as prepared as we can be. The best thing about it is this is our life, though, so it's not like we're preparing for a script or or a rehearsal. Mm -hmm. This is this is who we are. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Yeah. And I wanted to say something, too, really quickly on a phone call that we had prior, James, that I wanted to retract something I said. Sometimes we talk about CRAs. You guys are well familiar with the CRAs that are in there. And you know that they have an 80% weight on the decision that the board's going to give, right? And so what I said last time was, and I want to retract it. What I said is, if you have a mod high or a high and you're going to board, don't go. So what, what I, let me change that. If you have a recent, a recent mod high or a high, you can't go. When it's two years old, you have a little bit of wiggle room because then we can say it's stale and outdated because when you guys are programming, every month, every six months, every year, you guys are maturing. Every time you learn more stuff and your brain is being rewired, you're becoming a different, smarter, pro-social human being. That's why the CRA can only live in your file for three years. And after that point, they have to reevaluate you to see where you're at in your head. So a lot of the times I'll get inmates and they'll get in my, um, I'll have them and I'll say, well, we see that highs get out all the time. And I'm like, no, you don't. First of all, you don't know anything about that guy's case. How old was his CRA? Was it two years, 10 months old? And when was his last RVR? How, what is his institutional behavior like? And what was his programming like? So those are the three big things that we look at, right? Your institutional behavior, your programming, and then how old is your CRA? So we all know if it's a mod medium, you're in the zone, right? A mod low and a low, you're in the zone. But I've, I've heard of lows being denied too. So it depends on institutional behavior, your programming, and are you targeting your criminogenic needs? Like, don't go do flower shop if you're like, if you have a body on your record. You know what I mean? Like, don't do like, 
you know, inside out writers if you need to concentrate on criminal EBA or something, criminal thinking, you know? Yeah, so like uh, what you were talking about, one of the things that I shared with uh, Jesse and the Lifer group here on this yard, when I got here, I came from Ironwood and I just got a, a denial and I had a moderate five years clean and one of the things that the mm-hmm. commissioner said was that was that my psyche valve wasn't supportive of a release and that was mm-hmm. one of the reasons why he denied me he said but it was a moderate and it was over two years two years old so I was close to, to a new one and so when I came mm-hmm. here and I explained like my factors to Jesse and them they couldn't believe it and even after reading my transcripts they still couldn't believe I got a denial and I, I, one of the things I said is all of our cases are totally different from each other's, and we can't compare exactly. mine to his or exactly. his to mine. Yep. And, and that's exactly yep. what you're saying. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. Because that was that's, the that's initial right. mistake that I made. Mm-hmm. Compare mine to somebody else's, thinking I had Don't, five yep. years clean, I had a moderate. Nope. And I was going to be Don't released, and that, that simply wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. Nope. And everybody, you're right. See, that's the thing. And that's what, sometimes the yard talk is, is funny. And then when they get in front of me, I'm like, no, you can't hear it. You can't believe that because you don't know what goes on in that guy's file. Does he, and what are her, uh, right. by the way, and what are the RPRs like? Are they all 128s? Are they 115s? What are they? And here's the other thing, too, by the way. The, the board will often say, I have inmates come to me and they say, well, it's just a 128. It's just a window. It's just a light. And I'm like, okay, but this is what the board yeah. can say. If you can't follow the small rules on the inside of prison, how are you going to follow the small rules on the outside? And also, and I'm sorry, I'm, sure. I keep saying, I'm, I'm rambling, but there's no bright line. There's no five years. It's five years a good rule. That's a good line. But three years is really like the hard line. Like, um, Five years is great. We would prefer five years. But I've got, but I've seen and I've been part of like three years, you know, and mod meetings do get out, but it really depends on how do you talk? What is your institutional behavior like? What is your current RVRs? How much clean time? Did you target your pro, your criminogenic needs? Like what kind of programming have you been doing? And is it recent programming? And do you have, you know, the things that I gave Ricky Black in my pull packet, one of the, the very first documents is called Documents the Board Needs, and it talks about um, your relapse plan, a parole plan, um, victim remorse letters, mm-hmm. support letters. And I always tell my, my clients, too, by the way, get inmate character reference letters because you guys know better than anybody that you can bullshit the COs all day long, but you can't bullshit each other inmates. There's no secrets among the inmates. So get another dude that knows you and your journey for like two, three years. Or I've had guys write um, for my inmates that say, hey, man, I knew him 15 years ago up in Kern Valley, and I ran into him down here in Calipatria, and this is a different individual. If you can get inmates to write on you, it helps me. It helps the attorney talk about the biggest area of, of change called defender change. We have that thing called structured decision making framework. Yeah, Lisa, you know the crazy part is this is David. Um, I, 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 I strong arm the, the the headphones from Jesse. Now this is David, right? And look the thing is, is I'm gonna write Jesse uh, uh I mean I'm gonna write uh Ricky uh, uh support letter because um, Good. Ricky I met Ricky I met Ricky in a fight. <laughs> yeah that's how we met. <laughs> that's how I met him. Oh how funny <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I was, I was, yeah, I was, I was, um, yeah, Ricky's one, Ricky's one of my best buds here, and look, I, I was actually gang involved, <laughs> Ricky was a porter in a housing, yeah, Ricky was a porter in a housing unit, and me and my, me and my Shelly, we were like, you know, we got to get off on somebody so we can, like, earn our bones here, because we were on a 180 level four, and the door opened, and there okay. was Ricky Black, and that's why I met him for the first time, we ran down the stairs and attacked Ricky, right, <laughs> and, 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 and Ricky, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, how we met. Yeah, that's Ooh, how we met. But I'm gonna say that I tell everybody Ricky beat both of us up. You know, Ricky was <laughs> Ricky, uh, Ricky dodged, and moved it. Now Ricky did, Ricky did all right. You know, Ricky did all right for himself with two guys on him. You know, but we um and I'm excellent. the person that he is today. He's an ama- he's an amazing person, and um he's somebody that I go to as one of my accountability buds here. And, and uh, I'm gonna write him an amazing support letter to say about how how I met him. Good, good. And where we are today. Well, thanks thanks yeah. for saying that, by the way, Lisa. 
because I, I, I wanted David to hear that and, and also my friends to know that as well because that's something that, that we all need to do for each other. But um, yes. i got to go, you guys. You guys have a good time, and I'll talk to you tomorrow, Lisa. Yep, you know. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow, Dito. Yep, we'll keep going in right now. So, no, that's, that's cool, funny. man. Um, yeah, isn't that, isn't that crazy? Like, it, it's, a, yeah. it's a full circle moment where, isn't you know, it? it's not like, okay, this is... Yeah, this is a small, this is a small world in here, and I have, yes, I've is. just like I've harmed people out there. Yeah, I was involved with putting in work in prison. I was somebody who, who was constantly involved in situations where I wanted to increase my status and reputation. And look yeah. at how good of a person Ricky is. He wasn't doing that good then, <laughs> but yeah, he got into my crosshairs. But the fact of the matter is, is you never know who you're going to meet in and what capacity. You know. I mean, and here's the thing, too. It's funny that you said that. It's, thank you for saying that because mm -hmm. you guys realize how much work you put in for the gang, right? On the outside or on the inside, yep. whatever. Like, you're doing a lot of work for them. And so I always tell my clients that come to me, I'm like, hey, look, how much work did you do to put in to, for the time for the gang? Well, guess what? You got to put in Le the work. Un restante de 60 segundos. To be found suitable. It's, it's both sides. Which grass are you watering? You know what I mean? Now you have to put in the work to be found suitable, and you've got to do the work. Like, it just it takes time. It's not like an overnight miracle. And if you're determined, like you guys, like Ricky will probably have a good chance of getting out the way he sounds. But, you know, let's cross our fingers. And but when you do the work, you can see it and you can hear it. I can see it when I sit in front of you guys. I'm like, oh, this guy's come a long way. Or when, you know, and it's, a lot of it depends on age, too. If I get a 20 or 30 year guy, I'm like, okay, let's see how far he's come around his thinking, you know, versus the 40 or the 50-year-old yeah. guys are like, man, I'm tired of this shit. I got to get out of here. You know, it's just, it's funny. To see. And then I no, had a different crazy. mindset. I had the permanent or life is, you know. Yeah. No, it was crazy because when I get to a yard, you know, right off the bat, all right, Lisa. Uh, it was it was disconnected. Uh, he should be calling back in, in a moment or two. <clears throat> I hate those those fifteen minute uh, 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 limits. It doesn't make any sense, especially since they got unlimited phone calls. Uh, I would understand. Hilarious. I would understand on, on on the prison pay phones. You know, if they're jumping on those, then yeah, fifteen minute limit. Yeah. Uh, but but on these tablets, I mean, everybody has their own personal tablets, and uh, and uh, they definitely need to reevaluate and and and. Uh, <clears throat> remove those uh remove those limits so hopefully somebody uh uh you know gets them to do that you know sooner than later yeah that G this gtl thing this has been quite interesting it's an app that's still in progress of working out a lot of kinks i think sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't sometimes i can't get on gtl and i can't see any of my contacts it's a funny system but it's still not confidential and highly monitored, as we all know. <laughs> yeah, they remind us what I told. I think a total of three times. Or, uh, first, when we pick it up the call, and then two more times throughout the throughout the calls. Um, yeah, <clears throat> and that that's uh, that's really annoying, also. So, I mean, I think what that one time at the beginning should suffice. Uh, I mean, the, the the other you know the other uh, times that they're that they're announcing it, I think it's uh, it's it's overkill on. Uh, on that i'm pretty mm -hmm. sure but i'm pretty sure they do that to, to cover their bases like that when they do uh use these recordings mm -hmm. in, in court uh you, you i mean are you going to deny that that you didn't know that this was a recorded call exactly exactly because some guy will be like oh i didn't know it was com it wasn't confidential oh yeah you did bro it said it like six times in the phone call <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> all right yeah, yeah. so um so I, I know earlier on, I think you, you were talking about uh, uh, like uh, you're like uh, part of a group where where uh, you guys share like. A, so there's a, yeah. So. Uh -oh. oh, go ahead. Say by the by the call. Yeah. <laughs> this call is Global now being telling. recorded. Usted tiene una llamada prepagada de. David Lopez. Un individuo encarcelado en de la prisión estatal de Centinela, Centinela, California. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. You have a prepaid call. You will not be checked. Gracias por utilizar Global Tel Link. Hello, hello. hello? Hey. Yeah. I, pay no, I pay no mind to the 60 seconds. How long, what did you guys hear last? <laughs> <laughs> how long was uh, I off? <laughs> 
you were talking about Ricky. What, were you talking about Ricky, or or, or, or were we? Uh, were we? Yeah, passed? Ricky. Yeah, I, I don't remember exactly no, what part we left that. No, okay. So, I, do you remember when I told you when I first got here and uh, Jesse introduced me to Ricky? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I remember that. Yeah, so Jesse introduces me to Ricky. He tells me his name's Ricky. I tell him my name is David. And Jesse, I was telling Jesse about some of the stuff that I had got into before I got here, you know, some of the situations and stuff. And um, Jesse was like, hey, are you, weren't you the one that got, weren't you the one that, that did it to this guy? And he's like, no, it wasn't him. And he called me by my alias. He goes, he goes, it wasn't, he goes, no, it wasn't him. It was so, it was, um, it was okay. So I don't go by my alias no more. I had a I had a such a stupid alias, right? But um, it just starts with a D, right? So he tells me he goes, no, uh, it was D and T, which is the alias of the other guy. And he's like, this is D. <laughs> Jesse tells him this is D, and he looked at me and he's like, holy shit! He goes, it is you. He goes, what the? He goes, what the hell? Because he was so surprised. And when I seen him, we both looked at each other for the, like, we both, it was almost like we seen each other for the first time again, because that's how much we had changed. He goes, man, he goes, you could like, you know how, when you, everybody says when the board walks into the room or when you walk into the boardroom, the board can see right off the bat who you are when you walk in there. Mm -hmm. You can just tell mm -hmm. your, whole, mm -hmm. your whole, your whole aura is different. Your whole personality. Energy, is different. Yeah. You're not, yeah. Yeah. everything and our energy was so different and we get to talking man and he's just like what the heck you know like and i was so surprised we're healthy we got meat on our bones we don't have that like we don't have the sh we don't have the shifty eyes <laughs> you know there's, mm -hmm. there's like in here people mm -hmm. get the shifty people get the shifty eyes and i, <laughs> I gotta tell you guys yeah, yeah. So it was just it was an amazing thing to see ricky like that you know and um so we're back in the cell right now, yeah, so it's a little quieter. Jesse's right here, but he's he's getting situated. But I have to tell you a story about the shifty eyes, right? The worst <laughs> place that I still get the shifty eyes is the is the chow hall. I get the shifty eyes in the chow hall, in the dining hall, mm -hmm. and I don't know what it is about that place, right? But I'll be eating, and then I'll look up, and I'll actually like I'll look at somebody, and they'll look at me, and then I'll be like, damn. I wonder if he thinks that I was like staring at him, you know? And so I go down and I'm eating, and I look up, and now his whole hey. Hey, now his whole table's looking at me, right? The next time I look up, oh, right? Shit. And I'm like, oh, shit. You know, and I look away again, and then now my whole table's looking at me. Hey, oh, hey no. they said something is wrong. <laughs> hey, they said oh. something is wrong, and I'm just like, damn. So my whole table's kind of weird, and they all got the shifty eyes. And before you know it, the whole chow hall's got the shifty eyes. <laughs> and there's nothing going on except a miserable breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's how the shifty eyes happened and I don't know why this the last time that happened to me was about a week ago <laughs> where, where I just you can't look up like, anymore yeah <laughs> gotta stay with that yeah where I kind of yeah. just I kind of just and I'll be doing nothing like that. if anything I'll just be kind of like zoning out just waiting for them to call you know child release and stuff yeah and I'll look up and I'm like damn I've been kind of looking in this guy's direction for a little while and he's yeah. staring at me now like Who, you know what am I looking at and I'm like oh crap <laughs> And now everybody's all shifty eyed, you know? <laughs> that's yeah. hilarious. That's good shit. Yeah, that's the shift the shifty uh, eyes. So, yeah, the the board will yeah, read you when you go in that realm. And we'll and we can uh -huh. we can read the anxiety. And the board expects you guys, by the way, just so you know. I always hear the inmates saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. And the board is always saying, oh, we know, we understand, don't worry. And that's why I tell my clients, it's really important to write this shit down, your remorse, your plans, your parole, your relapse. Because if you have a hard time speaking yeah. in that room, they'll read everything ahead of time and they'll go, okay, this guy gets it. He may not be great on the spot. Like, yeah, can you imagine before? And I wasn't there with, before COVID. I've only been doing this for a year and a half now. But, but before COVID, you guys had to go into the BPA room with the actual panel presently physically in front of you and god forbid you guys have victims then those have to come in the room too and now you all are staring at each other in this closed confined space which makes it very difficult to feel uh, able to talk or freely be you know share your feelings it's, it's very it's a very uncomfortable situation it's definitely something not 
Yeah. It's hard. And that's why we say write this shit down because at least the board will read where your head is at and get a better Esta idea. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. Yeah, I have a lot of writing to do. I go to I go to my consultation in 2026 because I have a board date now in 2031. Even if things don't work out with my case, I have a um I have a board date in 2031, and it's scary because I qualify for elderly parole. I'm 40. Mm. Um, I'm gonna be 43, and I have an elderly parole date. I'll be in for 21 years, and I'll have um, and I'll be 50, and. It's scary to think because I heard a lot of bad stuff about elderly parole. Like they're not really like, like it's not a serious board hearing that they're just going to keep yes. taking off, you know. And, and I don't. So inmate Twitter, inmate Twitter just goes crazy about that. That's what I call oh, inmate Twitter. Oh, was it? Oh, that's oh, that's fun. Yeah. So here's the the real deal about in uh, elderly parole, which is PC thirty fifty five. You're right. They what yeah. they try to do is say, hey, once you reach a certain age. Your body is physically not as able-bodied as it was when you're 20, 30 years old. The problem is that all of us at 50 yeah. now are still physically able-bodied. Yeah. So unless you're like hooked up For to sure. an oxygen machine sure. and in a wheelchair and can't move, PC35 is not really your best friend. But the way I argue it or, or the way I say it in when the closing is I'm like, look, man, at 50 years old, at 50, you don't sweat the small stuff and it's all small stuff. And basically, my client has aged out of violence and criminal thinking. And sometimes I, it's interesting. Yeah. I was telling James earlier, I can see the difference between a 20 and 30 year old and a 40, 50 year old, because a lot of my older inmates will be like, oh, yeah, man, I was looking at the yard and I see the young guys are all running around still demanding respect and getting in fights. And I'm like, man, I'm so glad that's not me anymore. And I'm like, yeah, see, yeah. As you get older, you just stop giving a shit about the stuff that's not important. What's important? Because the other thing I say, hey, man, where is those gang members? Did they pay your attorney fee? Are they sending you packages? Are they sending you money for your books? What are they doing for you right now? The only people that really give a shit about you is your mom and your dad and your family, your loved ones. Those are the people that you need to be paying attention to and not the guys that are encouraging criminal behavior and ultimately not helping you get out. They're not doing anything for you. Yeah, those guys don't care about you, you know. And look, some of them, some of them do have, you know. I I did meet people over there that did like they had hearts. They weren't bad people. Mm -hmm. Jesse and I we yeah, were no. over there. Mm -hmm. I cared about people. Yeah, sure. You know, I was in sure. a, I was in positions of power and authority and stuff like that, and I cared about people. But for mm -hmm. the most part, I did what I had to do, and I did it without a second thought. You know, when things had to happen, yeah. I had to do it. You know, like it was just like, yeah. you know what? Um, I I tell the story about this youngster, right? He was a he was a kid, and he was probably 21, 22 years old, maybe even younger, maybe 19, you know, something like that. He seemed young, but he was mm -hmm. he was a young gang member, and I was I had control of the yard. I was the key holder, so something yeah. came up, and somebody had to get removed. Yeah, somebody had to get mm -hmm. you know removed off there, and somebody had to get mm -hmm. somebody had to get stabbed, you know, and. I, right away, there was these youngsters, they raised their hand, they're like, well, I'll do it, you know, and I was like, yeah. in my head, I was relieved, I was like, damn, cool, you know, because I didn't have to, like, it was hard to yeah. kind of convince somebody to do it, or I would have to give an order to somebody, and it's like, if somebody raised their hand, that was the easiest thing for me, because I was like, all right, cool, you're doing it, you're signed up, it's what it is, it's done, you know, so, but the kid was so proud, and I always think mm -hmm. about this, and I have a lot of guilt about mm -hmm. you know, about this about this mm -hmm. kid, you know, because he was so proud Good. that he was gonna put yeah. in work for the house, that he was gonna yep. that he was gonna represent for the gang, you know, for the prison gang yep. that you know that I was associated with, you know, and he he was like when I gave him the I gave him the knife, and he goes he goes I'm so just remember I'm so and so, and this is my barrio, and he said his he said his gang name, and to this day I don't know that kid's name, and I don't know his neighborhood. And I forgot it probably the same day that he said it. Yeah. And Jeez, that's yeah. a that's a telltale story right there because he was representing for me as a key holder. He was representing for the organization mm -hmm. and for the house. Like I was gonna put his name out there, and he was he was forgotten right after that happened. Yeah. I was more worried if I was gonna get rolled up on because they knew that I was a key holder and they knew that anybody that was in charge would have had to have sanctioned the hit. You know. 
And I was more yeah. concerned if I was going to be getting rolled up on the next day. You know, yeah. and it, it, the Jeez. crazy part is is that's what that lifestyle is. That was a long time ago. That was over 20 years ago. But that's what that mm-hmm. lifestyle was. That's what it represented. Yeah. You know, it's just we're, we're nameless faces. We're nameless faces. Yeah. yeah, we could remember the – sometimes we don't even remember the face. I just remember he was yeah. a, young, a young dude that was putting in work, and he was down for his neighborhood. But the thing is, the fact yeah. of the matter is, is he did it for no reason. He did it for, I mean, what, what did that, his life at that time, when you did something like that, you were in the hole for two years off of, off of yeah. that. You were in the, you were getting a shoe term, you know, he was back there. And then there was actual gang members back there. There was, there was members of the um, organized crime members back there that I was, that I was involved in. And he was going directly into that snake pit. He Jeez. went directly involved, you yeah. know, and who As knows what his life is like now. I know. You know what's crazy is that out of that tier, right, there was, it's a small section, and it was in North Kern State Prison, and um, the way that it was set up was um, one side was active, one side was was um, S&Y, but we were two separate worlds, and the section was very small. It was a small section, but I've come across people throughout the years that were in that in that section and i've also heard because it's a small system of people that were in there and i could count over five people on the top of my head right now just that i come in a, just you know their names have circulated throughout the years they're all dead you know uh, no. they're, they're dead and i think and i think about it including gang leaders there was gang leaders there that are dead and i know a lot of the people that were there with me and they're dead they got murdered and um, all of them were murdered. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. And those are so just sad. the people that I happen to hear about along the way. Yeah. Who knows how many people are, are dead from there or, or doing yeah. death, you know, who knows? And I think about that's what this system is. It's a, it's a machine of destruction. And until yes. we stop the cycle ourselves and until we acknowledge yes. what we have become, why we're doing it mm-hmm. and the reasons behind it, including our childhood traumas, we'll never be able to end there the cycle go. until we can answer those questions. And there you go. The board, Nailed when it. the board comes in, yeah, when the board asks, when the board asks me these questions, I'm going to be able to give them answers because this is who I am today. I have the answers yeah. that I found for myself. So there's nothing they can ask me right now that I won't be able to answer. I might not know all the million dollar words in the, in the, mm-hmm. in the key terms, but I can I can articulate myself and I can articulate my story and I know why A led to Z. You know I can explain and that and is. I still have time. When I go to board, I'm gonna go to board in 2031. You know, worst case scenario, I'm gonna go to board, but I'm gonna have over 14 years clean. I'm gonna have a bachelor's degree. I'm gonna have several other degrees and associate's degrees. Yeah, I'm gonna have prospects. I'm gonna be on a lower level. I'm finally gonna become level. I'm still level four. But next month, I'm going to drop down to level three finally. You know, I'm on an override. This is a level three yard. I'm here, I'm here on a behavioral override. They gave somebody with my history a behavioral override to a level three. And I'm finally, and I didn't show them that it was a mistake. I didn't come here and fight. I didn't come here and use drugs like other people did and get dirties and get involved with gang stuff. I came here and I continued my programming and I've actually improved my programming. And I'm finally going to be rewarded for it by becoming level three next month. That's huge. Good job. You know, and, I'm so proud of yeah, it. It and, takes a lot of work yeah, no. to do that. Le queda un restante de 60 segundos. I get to, I'm going to get to watch my friend walk out of here. I saw him. Well, I was incarcerated when he came in, but I was with him out on the streets before he caught his murder case, Jesse. And I'm going to get to yeah. watch him walk out of here as a free man. Oh, I hope so. God. You so rewarding. Me. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be crazy. Yeah, after 23 years, um, this thing's gonna this thing's gonna hang up right now. Do you want us to give you another call back, James? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Do it? yeah, yeah. Call back, call back. I, 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 call I got back I got now. a little bit of time on my hands, so so we could do one more. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> today's, today's my Friday at work, so I gotta celebrate. Uh, I've been I've been working for the last three days, and. Uh, uh, man, uh, this uh, this swing shift is definitely you know kicking my butt. You know, I go in uh, I go in a little bit later, uh, about 4:30, and, and I don't get off till about 3 a.m. So uh, uh, today, uh, um, you know, I had a, a you know, normally we, we do these calls with these gentlemen a little bit a little bit later. Normally, normally about four o'clock, but um, 
uh, uh, just, you know, being that I'm, I'm going to work at that time, uh, I asked him if we could do it a little bit earlier. And uh, so I, I, I only slept for a few hours. So so um, hopefully um, uh, I'm not uh, I'm not crashing and burning at work today. I got to definitely got to be, be as sharp as I can at work. So and here they go. They're calling back. This call is now being recorded. Global Telling. Usted tiene una llamada propagada de... David Lopez. Un individuo encarcelado en... De la prisión estatal de Sentinela, Sentinela, California. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. You have a prepaid call. You will not be charged for this. Gracias por utilizar Global Telling. Hello. Right on the wall. Yeah. yeah. So we just got a we just got a we just got a notice right now. Okay, so yesterday they did this Star Wars thing. I don't know if you remember Jesse talking about it earlier, but they got these yeah. guys that um they were drawing Star Wars. We got like uh Yoda on there, baby Yoda, Yoda we got uh stormtroopers mm -hmm. and it looks pretty cool. It's it's something I've never seen in prison, but it's all out of chalk, but um now there's now there's uh gang writing <laughs> and chalk all over the freaking all over the track. And so I guess some some wayward people got got some chalk, you know, and um, it, it's crazy that that's but that's a good example of this place. But the problem, what I've noticed, is that they they what they should do they got the cameras, but what they should do is just go reveal review the footage and stop messing with all of us because I thought that's what the cameras were supposed to be for. If you see an individual riding on the track and it's not on the wall right there where you're supposed to be drawing and you're just writing, go review the footage because they send the Mac reps around to give us basically a, a warning. But, you know, I, I think it's more of a threat, you know. But um, but it just goes to show how people can't appreciate a good thing. Like, that just goes to show that regardless of what we're showing you guys, the positive side of prison and the positive people of prison, the, the, the dark side is still here. Prison's still prison, you know, and, and it just goes to show that people can't appreciate a good thing. They can't appreciate a luxury, you know, like they, they're, they're actually going out of their way and allowing these guys to draw on the buildings and make this place more hospitable. But of course, the people mm -hmm. that are still hopeless are still on the side, you know, destroying it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what a shame. Yeah, it's crazy. It's just what this place is. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, um, yeah, so James, I think, yeah, this is going to be our last call. Is this going to get ready for yard? Yeah, we got to get ready for yard. We got lunch, got to get ready for yard. Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. I got to touch base with the wife. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to be in the dark house, definitely. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, good. You're, you're a wise man, David. I, I got, I got to go touch in with mine too, you know, because, uh, you know, I've been, uh, up here with these phone calls. I don't even think I told her good morning. And, and, and man, he's saying later, Holmes. Uh, uh, he, he's in the chat. <laughs> we got a lot of love for Iceman. That's the that's the boy right there. And um, Lisa, we feel like we feel like Lisa's like our our our, our mama bear protector. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but I you know. Yeah, I've had a lot of trauma as a child, and and, <laughs> and I feel like she understands. She understands it, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can we be your children? Yeah. <laughs> I know. No, but, you know, I no, like, we really, we no, really appreciate. We, we, hey, we really no, but we really appreciate you and everything that you that you've done and all the insights that you've done for us. And you're you're an amazing person and. I, like I've I've mentioned before on other on other calls and stuff, and um, we do these the things that we do for our community. And you're a part of our community. You might not be incarcerated, but you are a part a part of our community. You're you know, and we we represent our community, and we want to we we like to show people that you're not doing this in vain. We can't save everybody. Not everybody's going to live the way that we live, but there are good people in here, and you your work that you're doing is not in vain. Yeah, Ricky even said it right now. He's like, man, if I would have known that she was going to be my attorney, if I would have known that this is who it was, I would have never even hired an attorney. You know, he just didn't want to yeah. end up with some bullshit attorney, you know, uh -huh. and, and he was yeah. just like, man, if she's contributing of herself like this, I can imagine what she's doing for her clients, you know? Yeah. Uh, thank you know, you. One of these days, one of these days, 
one of these days, maybe uh, one of our files will land across your desk, you know? Yeah. Um, I know, I know. We are was, eligible, so yeah. you never know. So, yeah, uh, exactly. I'm going, I'll be and going I know next year. Update. I'll be going again next right? year. Right? We do get a bad rap, the State yeah, Board of Point Attorneys. Crazy. I have heard, so I'm trying to, you know, I can only help one person at a time, but I'm trying to make sure that we all don't suck, <laughs> sort of thing. <laughs> like... But well, like I said, I'm part of a group good, called Parole Justice good. Works, and 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 Heidi Rummel is the one that started. She wrote. It's called Amicus Curie. She was a friend of the I court. I know who she is. For, yes, thank you. So she founded. Awesome. She founded Parole Justice Works, where over 50 attorneys get together once every three weeks, and we sit down and we try to talk, figure out what's the best way that we can help you guys. And what are the what's the latest greatest that the commissioners are coming after, or 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 what do you guys need from us? So Heidi Rummel is the one. So my parole packet, you can even tell Ricky that several of my documents, whenever you see USD Gould, uh, that's Heidi Rummel's parole justice works uh, document. So a lot of yeah. my parole packet she is from her. She works with Elizabeth Kelvin. Yes, yes, she does. Yes, and they come to Calipatri and Satanara to do yep. workshops over there with you guys. Yep. yep. Yeah, uh, yes. she's awesome. Yep. Yeah, I was so. in I was I was in Calipatria, and my old Shelly was there doing the workshop that they were doing with USC Gold School of Law, and um, <laughs> yeah, he was an LWAP. Yeah. So they're doing yeah they're yeah. doing a lot. I know a lot about it. Um, I watch some of her yeah. videos sometimes. She she's on the state channel, her and Elizabeth Kelvin, and they do a lot of um yeah. they do like a podcast on there, and yeah they're they're Good. amazing women and and they're those are yeah. the, those are the kinds of people that we really appreciate. Hey, yeah. speaking of which, speaking of which, have you heard, Lisa, where they're actually like banging people over the head in the in the board, like people that are actually like talking to like numerous females and stuff like that, or like because I've heard somebody supposedly in Iowa got denied because they felt like he was being a manipulator because he had he was talking to two different females or something like that. You know, that's funny you asked that question because last time I was on here, that somebody else asked that same question. I haven't come across that in my. A particular experience but here's the thing you always have to wonder like what well what kind of conversations is being happening on that gtl what are they saying is it disrespectful is it this is it that like um because if you're because remember the number two reason for coming back to prison the number one is drugs and violence number two is domestic violence and so how are you talking to these women? Are you showing respect? So there's a lot of factors that can go into why he was denied if he was talking to multiple women. So it's very hard to, I don't, like I said, I haven't had that experience on my end with any of my inmate clients. But, there, you know, you and sometimes you don't hear the whole story. You only hear half the story. Man, I got denied because I was talking to a bunch of chicks. Okay, but what were you saying or what were you doing? Yeah. Was there any inappropriate um, uh, pictures, like, I've had guys, you know, women send, you know, excuse my French, but like titty shots or something. I'm like, okay, wait, you guys can't do that. These are confidential. These are not confidential tablets. So it really goes into, I think, what was yeah. being said in those convos. And sometimes, you know, these guys aren't going to tell you yeah. everything that they're saying or doing. So it's really case by case, as we discussed earlier. Every inmate has his own, you know road that he's hoeing as you say you know road to hoe yeah. and i don't no, mean that in the other way yeah really get part of the story you know so you don't know you don't know what, what, what they said in there what they did you know yeah and that's why sometimes yeah that's, and that's, sometimes that's I, was always, just, I was just saying too like the yard talk when it comes to cra highs and sometimes i get inmates come to me and they're like well i, I, I know guys get out with a high i've heard it i've seen it I'm like, okay, but you don't know anything about his case. And how old was his CRA? Was it two and a half years old? Because that's an entirely different human being from two and a half years ago. Um, two years ago, I was observing a yeah. hearing, and the guy had a high. He was a full-blown high. And you, in the decision and in the CRA, the last part of the, the transcripts for you, when you go to board, you have that decision section. And the same thing with the CRA, the last pages of those CRA tell you guys exactly what you need to do. So this dude, he had a high from two and a half, a little bit more than two and a half years ago. I was observing this hearing and I couldn't believe the way this guy was talking. He was so mature, so secure, so understanding of all the harms that he caused that in my head I was like, whoa, is this how all inmates, this is when I first started, is this how all inmates are? Because this guy is like 
a model inmate, but he had a high. So I watched, I listened to the whole thing. And then at the end, the board was like, man, you've really come around all the corners. Like you're going to be found suitable. So in that particular case, he was found suitable. But if you could have heard this guy talk and the way he spoke and the understandings he had of the shit that he did when he was, you know, in his criminal thinking days and even in prison days, he was a completely different person. So that's why it's hard to say the yard talk, oh, well, highs get out. Yeah, but what is that guy's deal? You know, how old was the CRA? How many RVRs right. did he have? Are they 128 or are they 115? Like, there's so much that goes into each guy's case that you can't just say, oh, a high will get out. I'm going to go. Screw it. Fuck it, you know? But it's not a good look to go with a high. It's just right. recent. Right. If it's a recent high, you're going to be screwed, kind of. Like, and here's the thing. If you go with a high and it's recent, and I mean like within a year, that's too short of a time, kind of, to do the things that the brain needs to do to unwire some. It's, it's a process to unwire your brain. So... The board, part of the problem when going there's, with the high a is the board Because if you go with the there's, high, there's you have a to guy remember. who just went recently with the high. Okay, what happened to him? And, and, and same thing with him. I, I tried to explain to him because we went to board a, a few months apart from each other. I also got a high. I got a three year denial and I had a high psyche valve. And he got a high psyche okay. valve. I got a high psyche valve because I had just went to court for a case that I picked up in, in February of 2020, and I picked up more time mm -hmm. about eight months mm -hmm. before I went to the psyche valve. This guy went and got mm -hmm. a high psyche valve, and he petitioned the board nine months later to go back to the board. And I tried to explain to mm -hmm. him, like, bro, mm -hmm. why would you? You mm -hmm. think they're gonna walk? You, mm -hmm. you think you think they're gonna walk back what they said about you eight months ago, nine Thank months you. ago? You Thank think you. anything's gonna change? You. you know. Thank you. Exactly. And here's the thing, too, by the way, just so you guys know, when you get a denial, three or five or whatever it is, you do have that opportunity to, do, to put down a petition to advance, right? That PTA. But I talk about that PTA like yeah. I, 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 I ache in it to Willy Wonka and the Charlie Chuck. <laughs> Willy Wonka's Charlie Chuck. Blech, I can't even talk. But you know that golden ticket the kids have and they can you only know, use it one time? Yeah. It's a one time use. So if you have a right. five-year denial, yeah. you only get to put a PTA down one time during that five year, and you better make it worth it. Don't, yeah, like you said, no guy's gonna unwire his brain in nine months with a high. Like, do the work that they're telling you to do, and usually it's about half the time. If it's a three-year, they'll put a PTA in at about a year and a half. If, if it's five, it's, it's what I've been witnessing is it's about a two and a half. But you have to do, they can deny the PTA like you, like your guy just happened. If you don't have changed circumstances or what they call new info, they're not going to advance your hearing. You have to do more programming, get more laudatories, have more clean time, um, do the things that the decision said to do. If they said, hey, you need CGA, then get in CGA. Or if you can't get into a class, you guys can always do in-cell classes. And I, in my parole right. talk, I talk about well, doing see, this report. You can well, do see, this guy, he actually can't. got advanced, yeah. right? They, they advanced wow. him so that they could deny him because it's like, okay. yeah, they advanced him and then they denied him. But it's like, come on, bro. Like, you knew they were going to deny you. It was nine months after they had already denied. Well, now it's about a year, a little over a year that he went. But when they granted his advancement, it was nine months after they had just denied him a three years. So what they said is they're like, all right, well, let's call him back and we'll get an extra year out of this three year because now he, he can't come back any time sooner than the three years. Yeah, yes, it exactly. It's only once every three years you do that PK. So I always tell them, hey, plan your strategy. This is like a football game when you guys have, you know, the strategies and strategics in a game. Plan your exit. I call it the board game. Like you got to move your pieces around the board to fit to, so they can find you suitable. Do the parole plan. Do the relapse plan. Get a victim remorse letter. Have transitional. Get support letters from the outside and get inmate character reference letters from the inside. Like, all these pieces have to come into play for them to go, oh, this, I often say, would the board feel comfortable if you were their next-door neighbor? Would they, would they be comfortable if, you know, you guys were their neighbor? If they do, then you're going to be found suitable. But if there's still some weird hiccups in your file, they're going to be like, yeah, I don't know. I don't think I want this guy as my neighbor. We're going to keep him. He, he needs to come around the corner on a few more things. And a lot of what I hear is always about yeah. self-awareness. And inside. Le queda un restante de 60 segundos. 
Esta llamada y su número de teléfono será controlada y grabada. This phone is gonna, this phone's gonna wrap up right now. Yeah, it's gonna cut out in yeah. 60 seconds. I really want to thank you for being here, Lisa, for sharing your time with thank us, and, and we look forward to interacting with you, engaging with you in the future. Thanks for everything you do for us, and, and definitely I, we appreciate your commitment. Yeah, James, thank, thank you. Thank you. And, you know, just a shout out to all the listeners and to my beautiful wife. <laughs> yeah, shout out cool. to everybody yep. listening. <laughs> thank, thank you. Good. You know, thank you guys. Especially the women that stand you know, by you guys in prison. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, for you know, sure. Behind every strong man is a strong woman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, but thank You're you guys awesome. again. You know, I'll I'll look forward I'll look forward to talking to you guys again soon. And um, James, we'll we'll stay in touch. All right, perfect. Hey, thank you guys. I really appreciate it. And like I said, around here, yep. life's like a candle. Once you blow it out, it's lights out. And with that. We are out. Hey, thank you, Lisa. Once again, I appreciate it. everybody that tuned in and uh, other supporters on the chat. And dropping all those comments, really, really appreciate it. Unfortunately, uh, we got to go ahead and cut the stream. I got uh, uh, I got some other things to attend to, and Lisa's been on here for over two hours. So, you know, once again, I, I do I do appreciate your your, your dedication and, and, and all the information that, that you're providing our, our listeners and to myself also. Thank you. You're more than welcome. You're more than welcome. All right. Perfect. Enjoy, enjoy Everybody, enjoy your Sundays. Hopefully, you guys are doing so, something nice. And uh, Chubby Jessica, Vero559, uh, Tammy, and everybody on YouTube or, uh, or on, on TikTok. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and cut it now. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, thanks, James. We'll, see, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Uh, all right. Bye-bye.